October 20th, CPDC meeting. Um, so our agenda today has the uh, public hearing for Article 8 going first. We're actually going to take things out of order, and we're going to take the request for minor modification to minor site plan and review for 632 Main Street Family Dental. And I believe you're here for that. So. Uh, Robin Parker, um, uh, the architects, and I'm representing Dr. Moon, who owns a family dental at uh, 632, 636 Street. Perfect. And uh, we had done earlier with um, facade renovation, and it was a little, almost the same. What we're going to be doing, I don't know how much information you want, is um, essentially Dr. Moon is going to be renovating the entire Main Street facade. We're going to be removing the blue plastic awning. We're going to be removing the ski hut roof <laughs> and the uh, somewhat modern brick. And, um, I, I came here before where we were going to be leaving the existing storefront and essentially putting six new windows and new brick with a little bit of um, historic detailing on the brick and a wood sort of frame around the storefront. Um, we had a little bit of delay, we had some contractors back, back out, and during that time, um, MF Charles Building, yeah, this is very bad coloring, so don't look too bad. Um, MF Charles Building was completed, and Dr. Mu really liked the windows of the MF Charles, the, 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 um, I think we have the single story building that's right next, and the bakery, and we decided this was an opportunity for us to sort of add Think, rethink the design a little bit by adding, um, picking out the existing storefront and adding new wood windows. And at that time, it had been, when we first came, it was a suggestion of various design agencies in the town that we sort of rethink we had half dome windows. Well, we had this opportunity now that we rethought those windows and we put in that slightly arched windows, which are, you see a lot in um, some of the store count, uh, buildings around Reading. So we've come back now for a minor site plan at Google, I guess, with a, I think, a better facade design, um, taking into account some of the comments that were made and putting in um, new wood windows that are going to replace those storefront that is there. So it's new wood windows and a new door. And we're going to be bringing brick all the way down uh, with a stone and tablature and just wood panels under the, the new windows. So are there three changes from the previous version? I think um, I see three. I guess so. what you would say three changes would be that we're, um, the window type is no longer the half dome. We yep. arched it, okay? And then the, I guess you could say the first floor, the storefront, taking out the existing storefront system and putting in the new wood windows with the same rhythm. Oh. We're not adding any new door or any new um, entrances. We're keeping the single door where it is. Gotcha. And the awnings? The awnings, they were as they were before. Oh, they we were? Okay. Pre -met, I yeah, thought they we were pre awnings. And we had the banding, we had the pilasters, the cornice, the floor mm -hmm. Good. Thank you. And um, we did, in this permit set, add some of the construction, how we're going to be fencing off the, you know, off the front of the building. This is going to go a little bit easier than MF Charles because the sidewalk is very wide in front of Family Dental and there's kind of two potential paths around the, the area. And we also have the um, back that we will own a small uh, piece of land behind the building which will be able to use as a lay down area, which is uh, shown in this construction plan and we sort of attended a pre construction meeting with the this Friday. They're coming as well. Gotcha. Very okay, good. Thank you. <coughs> Nick or Dave, uh, start us off any comments? No. Well, good. Yeah, I like it. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> Jean or Jesse, anything from your perspective? Um, I was just, I know that the rendering, um, it's always hard to get the color right. We always hear a lot about color, so I thought I would ask the question to clarify on the color. Yeah, sorry, the rendering is the AutoCAD rendering. Um, the colors, uh, Family Dental has a blue, particularly blue color. And in the uh, first plan we came through, we had the blue awnings also, the green metal blue awnings. And the blue is underneath the, um, the new windows. We're not 100% on the blue. We may paint that up with like two, I think it says to be determined maybe in the blue underneath. That may go a 
windows are going to be sort of a, not a mahogany, not what you see on MF Charles building, but slight, probably more of a solid mahogany, a darker color. We're going to be using uh, aluminum clad wood windows on the upper part. I know it's really hard. And then, you know, it looks great on my monitor, and then you print it, I print it, somebody else prints it. <laughs> Gene samples would be helpful. That would be for very you. helpful. Yeah, if we could. Um, usually, it's Panatone samples that we get, so we can understand exactly what color blue you're talking about. And then, as you decide on the wood panels below the, the knee knee wall area, that would be helpful to understand that color too. Mine that is white around the existing opening and. It's that may, we may go back to sort of a white on the window. Did she, I'm sorry, yes. did she um, ever consider doing an alternate material for the awnings at all, like doing a fabric at all? Like the MF Charles has um, the stationary frame awnings with fabric. No, uh, we, I mean, we, not at this time, I can okay. certainly ask the question again, but uh, I spent a lot of time tweaking the windows, getting that, the yeah. right height, getting discussing the arch, they have squashed arch, so. So this material on the awning would be, what is it? It's mm -hmm. metal. It's metal. Mm -hmm. it's, it, that, it was the reborn, the yeah. galvanized metal. Mm -hmm. <coughs> is there anything um, for illumination? Being planned? Uh, no, but the only, we're going to keep the in the sort of the entryway. There was a recess light. This is a recess ceiling. We're going to be keeping a recess light there. There were um, lights in the awning, but I don't think they've ever been turned on, and we're not planning to have any lights under these awnings. So there's, we're just keeping the existing recess light in the entry. Does she keep evening hours? She open no. in the evening? No. no. So there's really no need for it. Comments? Questions? There's a um, draft decision in the packet. Oh, yes. Should I look at that? Um, it's at the front of the packet. <laughs> so we probably want to add a condition relating to providing color samples. Yep. Uh, one other question I had had to do with the, the wall that's facing the courtyard, that mm -hmm. southern facade. Is there anything planned for how she's going to use that? Or um, After we get this permitted, we're going to be focusing on the second floor, about um, what to potentially do with the second floor, because we are putting windows up there. And we have she is thinking potentially to put an apartment for her own personal use up there. So we uh, uh, maybe windows up there. I, I can't say right now what will happen about that. Mm -hmm. Coming soon. <laughs> what about the TVD on the wood paneling at the bottom? Do we need to add a condition about that? So what we can do is, um, yeah, the applicant shall submit a okay, color and tone samples color. to ensure okay. consistently with site plan review mm -hmm. decision for the awnings and the wall. Okay, perfect. Okay. <coughs> Good. Got a motion? Move that the CPDC uh, approve the minor modification request for the project at 632 Main Street, Family Dental, as amended. Second. All those in favor? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be in touch. We'll be in touch. Okay. Thank Thanks. you. All right. Let's move on to the fun stuff. <laughs> um, so next on the agenda is the public hearing for Article 8 of the subsequent town meeting uh, 2014 for the comprehensive update to the zoning bylaw. But before we begin, are there any boards, commissions, committees that need to call themselves to order? Yes. So I would like to call the zoning advisory committee to order, please. Any other? 
No, I think I meant for bylaw. Okay. Perfect. All right. Well, um, I'm going to ask Nick to read the uh, public notice, and then we'll jump in. First went to Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 48, Section 5, Adoption or Change of Zoning Ordinances or Bylaw. Notice is hereby given that the Reading Community Planning and Development Commission, CPDC, will hold a public hearing on Monday, October 20th, 2014 at 7.30 p.m. in the Selectmen's Meeting Room of Reading Town Hall, 16 Lowell Street. To amend the Reading Zoning Bylaws by deleting Sections 2.0 Definitions, 4.0 Use Regulations, 5.0 Intensity Regulations, 6.0 General Provisions Affecting All Districts, 7.0 Administration, 8.0 Applicability, and 9.0 Adoption and Amendment in their entirety, together with all appendices associated with such sections, and replacing them with new sections, 2.0 Definitions, 4.0 Administration, 5.0 Use Regulations, 6.0 Intensity Regulations, 7.0 Nonconforming Uses and Structures, 8.0 Sign Regulation, 9.0 Parking, 10.0 Overlay Districts, 11.0 Planned Development, and 12.0 Applicability, Adoption, and Amendment. Together and all appendices, the texts of which are available for inspection between 7.30 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. Monday through Thursday and until 7 p.m. on Tuesdays in the Community Services Department at Reading Town Hall. Thank you. Uh, before I forget, if you haven't done it already, please sign in in the back uh, before you leave. Um, so let me give a brief introduction of this public hearing. Um, so what's the purpose of tonight? It's really to uh, finalize a draft zoning bylaw for the town of Reading that the CPDC will ultimately vote on to uh, approve for November town meeting. Um, we want to hear from all of you. We want to give you the opportunity to discuss and debate different topics. Um, and we have the opportunity here to amend the bylaw that will ultimately go before town meeting. Uh, so everyone here who wishes to speak will be given the opportunity to speak. Um, we'll start with a brief introduction by uh, the assistant town manager of the work that's been uh, undertaken and a summary of the updates. And then after that, we're going to kind of take things uh, a little differently here. Normally, CPDC would uh, start with a, a debate and a discussion, but given the fact that the three of us and, and our other member who's not here with us have been intimately involved in this work, we're going to just skip right over that and jump right into the public hearing. Um, so when called upon, please introduce yourself by name, and um, if possible, if you do have some sort of issue or concern, let's try to be constructive and let's offer recommendations on how to improve things. So Jean, I'll pass it off to you. Thank you. I'm just going to run through some slides just to um, frame up the discussion, but before I get into the slideshow, I, I just want to make a few comments. Um, when I started five years ago with the town of Reading as the town planner, one of the first meetings that I attended on a public forum had to do with customer service. And um, that meeting was something that the Board of Selectmen was uh, really focusing on and responding to and how do we provide excellent customer service in the town of Reading. And one of the things that came up was um, that we certainly can't do our best when we have bylaws and regulations that are confusing, complicated, and <clears throat> difficult for the public, and overly complicated for staff. So having rules that are clear and regulations that allow ease of administration were two overarching goals when we started this process. Uh, uh, over a year ago, a year and a half ago. And CPDC um, spent a lot of time, maybe even two years ago, saying, how do we go at this? How do we tackle this? How do we take this unenviable task of pulling apart the rules for land use in the town of Reading? And um, we did a phase one. We brought that to uh, November town meeting 2013. And we did some things that CPDC felt needed to be addressed pretty quickly. One of them was putting a moratorium on the medical marijuana uh, dispensary. Um, and so since, since September of 2013, the Zoning Advisory Committee met with staff. CPDC was intimately involved. The Zoning Board of Appeals was very involved. The Conservation Commission was very involved. Um, 
the Board of Selectmen has been involved. Um, and we've had countless public forums, public meetings um, to try and get us to where we need to be. So I'm just going to run through real quickly kind of what that all looked like. Um, the big problem, obviously, is that this bylaw was first adopted in 1928. And as is the case with zoning, you update from time to time. The problem is, as you make these updates, it's not really done in a comprehensive manner. So these piecemeal changes kind of got us into the trouble that we're in today. Um, again, we're, we're trying to create clear pathways for people to do permitting. And that's really the overarching goal. We've heard a lot of feedback that um, it could improve, and that's what we're trying to do here. So um, the three goals that we kept saying over and over for the last 14 months are simplify, modernize, and clarify. And that's really the goal. From that, the permitting process will improve. And um, the redundancies, the irrelevancies, the provisions that no longer relate to anything, those are the things we want to omit. So new language, old language, the changes that um, we need to apply to make this bylaw work, to make it be relevant to today's modern needs, and to have it comply legally. We also <coughs> spent a lot of time, at least in the five years that I've been here, and certainly long before that, doing planning and doing land use planning around a master plan, a housing plan, an open space and recreation plan. Um, and all of that planning work ideally would then be reflected in the rules for land use. Um, this is a slide that just um, gives you an idea of who was involved in the Zoning Advisory Committee. Marcy West is the chair of the Board of Selectmen, if you just want to wave as I call your name out so people know who you are. Um, David Trinello, who is the vice chair in the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, Dave Tuttle from the CPDC and Jeff Hansen from the CPDC. Eric Bergstrom, who was our resident and um, financial services professional. Aaron Calvobachi, who was also a resident and a local business owner. And George Katsoufis, who was an uh, associate member of the CPDC and a resident. Um, just to go through again, timeline, um, the important thing here wow. is um, we've had any number of updates and um, a website that has been actively uh, providing changes as they become available. And this has been going on now, as I say, for the last 14 months. Um, tonight we're at the public, the CPDC public hearing stage. Last week there was a, a public forum for town meeting members. Um, that was something we had asked town meeting back in September if they would be interested in coming to a public forum where we could provide some more information. And uh, so that happened last week. Um, any number of ways you look at it, there's been a lot of discussion. 40 ZAC meetings, four public forums, and we use Turning Point, which are these handheld devices, to get opinion and feedback. We had a number of stakeholder meetings. I called it the rubber chicken circuit. We went out and we went to the Lions meetings. We went to the uh, bank, and there were a bunch of business folks that stayed after hours, and uh, we gave them better than average refreshments, and they told us what they thought. Um, we also uh, went to the Rotary and heard from them, got their feedback. Um, again, the project website. We do a biweekly notes out of my office. It's about 4,000 email addresses. And so we gave updates uh, pretty regularly, if not monthly, every other month. And then uh, any number of updates to the Board of Selectmen. Um, every town meeting we've, we've used to provide updates. Um, and then we've had RCTV cover some of our meetings, press releases, and updates to the boards. But really, the, what we wanted to find out is you know, what was the public input. And a big driver on all of this was to get public input so that we could get it right. And we heard about how confusing the bylaw is and how it has to be rearranged or recodified. We also heard about how overly complicated it was. So we wanted to simplify, especially with regard to the permitting process. We heard a lot of um, complaints that that process is just too too complicated. Um, we heard a lot of input and feedback about accessory apartments, which I'm sure we'll get into tonight, uh, but primarily to make the rules clearer and the process simpler. Um, and the overarching thing is to preserve the neighborhood character. 
So that's, that's the challenge. The Aquifer Protection District, a lot of uh, other communities, their standards aren't as strict as ours, so we took another look at that. Medical marijuana dispensaries, that was approved in September. And non-conforming, those are the uh, houses that were built in, um, long before zoning was ever even imagined. So um, we want to make sure we get the non-conforming piece of zoning right so that nobody's overly penalized. So the schedule moving forward, um, the sections highlighted in yellow are what will be before town meeting in November. So the definitions, um, administration, use regulations, intensity regulations, non-conforming uses and structures, and applicability and severability. Um, section three was finished, so that's green. That was done in September. Um, some other things were done as well. The purpose we'll come back to in annual town meeting in the spring, as well as signs, parking, overlay district, and plan development. So here it is again, special town meeting. Um, this past November, uh, September 29th, 2014. All of these in green were approved. The gray it was not approved, the purpose. So that's something we'll circle back to. Um, again, what's before town meeting commencing November 10th for subsequent town meeting, administration, use, definitions, intensity, nonconforming, applicability, and severability. Then at annual town meeting will be these items we need to pick back up again um, so that really this is being designed in more manageable bites as opposed to one big bite. Um, we'll probably need to come back in November of 2015, edits as needed, and to hopefully consolidate definitions once we get through everything. So I'm just going to go a little bit quickly now into the, what we're um, talking about tonight is the definitions, um, essentially a lot of organization, putting the core definitions in section two, went back and forth, back and forth, all the definitions in one spot, the definitions in the sections. But because we're doing this core piece of zoning for November, the feeling was, let's just deal with the core definitions in Section 2, the definitions that um, really only have applicability in a section will stay there, and then we'll come back and put them all in Section 2 at the end. Um, so something like an accessory building, uh, that's obviously, the graphic helps a lot, and I especially like the size, <laughs> because um, the accessory building in, in planning terms is a uh, much, you know, different thing than having two buildings the same on the lot. It's accessory to the primary building. Um, we have a lot of new definitions in the, um, the draft that's before you. Um, sub some subsections are here. Some have been modified. And then go moving on to administration, now that's up front in section four. And it includes standards for special permits, which I know make the attorneys much happier. Um, anytime you do a special permit, you should have standards for uh, why you're issuing or why you're not issuing that special permit. So that's been clarified. Um, we, used, we currently have three separate special permit granting authorities. That's been consolidated. Um, the CPDC uh, will be the special permit granting authority for statutory requirements, also approving site plans, ANRs, subdivisions, and then that can be incorporated with site plan review. Um, we, we heard from folks that, you know, we're bouncing from board to board, go to zoning board for this, come back to CPDC for that, and it was overly complicated, so we've streamlined that. Um, for site plan review, which is a big part of what we do here at CPDC, there's no change in the thresholds. The uses and activities requiring site plan review are reformatted for convenience. We think it's clearer. That's the main thing. Use regulations, um, over 100 pages of scattered provisions are the current section four. That's been reorganized and I think a lot easier to understand. We've got two tables of uses now. We've got updated requirements for accessory uses, a new section on accessory buildings and structures. Accessory apartments now are clarified and new provisions are included. Carriage houses, we heard a lot about um, how we needed to do something with that. The special permit is now separated out uses into the new subsection and is an updated nursing home and assisted living facilities. Um, accessory apartments, I, 
everybody knows, pick up the Boston Globe, you can see aging demographics are what's driving this conversation. Um, and so we're thinking about how can we make this provision of land use the most flexible that it can be for our residents. Um, and the key here is that this is low impact supplementary housing. It's something that we identified in our housing production plan as a way to provide housing. And the key is that it's now woven into existing neighborhoods, that it's not going to change. You're driving by, you wouldn't even notice that it was an accessory apartment. You wouldn't be able to tell. That's the goal. Um, and so there are a couple of different ways to do it. Um, we're saying allowed in S15, S20, or S40, uh, or in a pre-existing single family dwelling in business A or business B, and that performance standards are the key here so that we tell, we state right up front, and we saw this in the town of Lexington, um, they put in their performance standards for what the expectation was, um, and then so if you wanted to go in and go to the building inspector and apply for a permit, all of the requirements are stated in those performance standards. Um, and so the change here is that in a house, in an attached, the uh, attached accessory apartment, like putting an apartment uh, uh, in the basement or whatever, um, that would be by right. But again, you'd have to meet these performance standards. Um, so for a pre-existing detached accessory apartment, that would be by special permit, as would all the other two categories. If it were new construction and it were attached, you're putting an addition on your house, say, that would be under a special permit. Um, and then the last category is new construction detached. So if, it, if you were building a pool, uh, garage um, and you wanted to put a, an accessory apartment in, that would be by special permit as well. So those are the changes in a nutshell for accessory apartments. Um, noting that the CPDC, I'm sorry, the Zoning Board of Appeals will be the special permit granting authority for accessory apartments. That's something they've been heavily involved in and they're going to keep that. Intensity, there really aren't any major changes. Again, reorganizing being the, the, main, the main thrust of it. Nonconforming uses and structures. Um, you know, basically, we have a lot of nonconforming uses and structures in Reading, and so we need to come up with a way to deal with this that's going to be fair and equitable and simple. So that if somebody wants to put a deck on their nonconforming uh, worker's cottage in the downtown, they don't have to go through an elaborate process through the Zoning Board of Appeals. That house has been there since 1910, <coughs> long before zoning, and as long as it conforms with the dimensional requirements, we felt as though that that's something that should go fairly easily uh, as a by right through the building inspector and not through the Zoning Board of Appeals. Applicability and severability, that's been updated. Um, the language was streamlined and invalidity was included. And that's it for me. Thank you. All right. Well, now we're going to turn it over to all of you. So who wants to start us off with uh, public comment input? Nancy. I was kind of <laughs> hoping you would. <laughs> Nancy to me, um, I am a town meeting member in Precinct 3. I'm also a local architect who deals regularly with residential construction. And so I have looked at the bylaws with that kind of view. How is it going to affect most those people that I work with? And there are uh, a number of things that, you know, I probably will start out with. Um, I have other comments in here too. But, the, but what I would like to talk about most is the section 5.5.1 um, A and B, which happens to deal with accessory structures. And I see that as being, in addition to accessory apartments being allowed, which I am very much in favor of. I think that section has changed in such a way that it is going to severely restrict most of us in Reading from ever having a detached garage in our backyard. So I want to just point out a couple of things that I noticed, and I'd like to hear from you guys how you feel this fits and whether there's other ways we can approach this. And I have talked to Jean and Jesse at length with this today. But So if we look at 5.5.1a, 
Um, it's, I don't know if anybody has copies of this, but it's accessory mm. buildings. I have it on the Oh, screen. you do. Excellent. All right, great. So the first two, A and B, are the two that have changed the most. Those don't exist in the bylaws as I have them now. And so if we look at A first, since it's A, um, it is going to limit the maximum height of any accessory building. So I want, you know, I, I guess the question is why are we doing this? What is the net effect and what is the point of doing this? If you look at a lot of the detached garages, and I'm looking at some of the historic detached garages in the town of Reading, which are absolutely gorgeous barns, this would eliminate anyone because of that height restriction being able to do that ever again. And I'm not sure I want to live in a community where I can't have someone who says to me, I want a barn in the back of my house. I have a big piece of property. It'd be lovely to have this gorgeous barn. We can't do that anymore because the height restriction would keep us to a very low-pitched building. If you look at a typical two-car garage at 24 by 24, if, and it, I know that the maximum height, I believe, is based on the definition of maximum height, which if you have a gable or pitched roof goes to the midline between the eave and the peak, uh, although I think that's how we're reading this. Um, it gives us somewhat of a gable, but it doesn't give us the second floor. It doesn't give us any leeway in how that's going to look. You look at a, a two-car garage, you're going to end up, if you have any kind of slope to that land, you can end up with a three-pitch, a five-pitch. Most of these capes have 12 pitches. Those are pretty steep pitches to their roof. You put this very shallow looking pitch next to it, it's going to look like, and this is my comment, and I'm sorry, New Hampshire, but a lot of those prefab buildings you see off the side of the road, they're just very low pitched, quick buildings. Um, I wouldn't like to see that in my neighborhood. I have some gorgeous, you know, garages in the neighborhood. That being said, that's an aesthetics thing. Um, the other piece to it is that it's limiting it to a single story. Um, there are a lot of beautiful garages out there that have uh, a nice pitch to it. You can get a second story. People have put in, in the past, and I've been part of that, put in living spaces. If you're a painter or you're doing any kind of hobbies, hobby work and you want an extra space above <coughs> your garage, it's a great way to gain that space for not having to spend a lot of money because you're already building a garage on your site. So that's going to exclude anyone from being able to do that in the future because you've eliminated any habitable space in these accessory structures except for accessory apartments. The second one, B, I think is even harder to understand. Um, the limit of 25% of the floor area, and of course we haven't defined floor area, is that net? Is that gross? Even assuming gross. For those of us in the town of Reading who have small homes, and I, would, I don't know what the percentage is, but I would venture to say, based upon my clients, that I work with a lot of capes, a lot of ranches in Reading, that you're probably looking at a house that's typically 1,500 square feet, 1,800 square feet. If you're limiting it to 25%, you can't get a two-car garage, even if you have the land on your property, unless you had a McMansion. So if you go back to that example of a typical two-car garage at 24 by 24, you're looking at around 600 square feet. 25% would mean I need a 35 or 3,000 square foot house before I could qualify for a two car detached garage in my neighborhood or on my property. That's not fair. Why should I have to add on to my house in order to be able to get a two car garage? So I find that to be particularly difficult to uh, if, you know, accept for the town of Reading. And you're really telling those that have big houses, yeah, you can have a garage. And those of us with small houses, because we want them small, we can't have a garage. So, or we could maybe have a small little single car garage. So those are the two main things in this particular aspect that I take great exception to. And I don't know if you want me to stop there. I've got other things, but maybe let's we can yeah, maybe let's that. stop there and talk through that. And I, maybe I would add. I mean, what, what do you think your clients want? What would they want to see? That's I think, realistic. I think, and I think the, what it was before was great. Um, I, I think that limiting it to one story is not what people are looking for. Most of the garages I've designed, and actually we have some clients here that are, are very concerned because they haven't built those garages yet, have a second floor because they want to be able to put 
whatever that hobby is, or even a rec room for their kids to get them out of the house a little bit more. So limiting it to one story, I just think is going to really mm. decrease the, about, the ability for people to be able to use it. I think we talked a little bit about perhaps a way to not have a gigantic two-car, two-story structure right next to the, to the side yard or rear yard, is that as it gets bigger, perhaps it has to move over on the property. So you could have, you know, if a 15-foot setback is what's required for a house, I could put a two-story, two-and-a-half-story house in the back of my house. You know, I could, I could extend back on that property without a problem, and, and, and that's by right. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if perhaps a better way to look at this is to think of it in terms of if it's a single-story garage, perhaps it can be five feet from the property line. If it's a two-car garage or, or a two-story structure, perhaps it has to be 10 feet from the rear and side. Something along those lines, rather than limiting the height or limiting the use of that building, maybe limit where it can be located on a piece of property. Um, to me, that's a little fairer than trying to say you can't have a two-car garage that has a room above it, uh, or any garage, or any accessory structure. And then I think the 25%, I, think, I don't think that that helps anybody. I don't think that's a good limit to use. I'd rather see it be such that it's, it's, if it's a larger structure, it needs to be more conforming um, and leave it at that. Um, <coughs> most, and you've got the 25% lot coverage. So if you've got a small lot, you can't, you know, if you've got a pool in the backyard and then you want a garage and you want this, you, you really can't because you're limiting how much you can use of that backyard. It has to be open space. So I think you already have a self-limiter on the smaller properties. If you have a 40,000 square foot piece of land, why couldn't you have a big garage there? I, you know, a three-car garage, for example, which we allow, can be as wide as 36 feet in order to accommodate three cars in it. So you know, you're already allowing a large accessory structure for three cars. And then you turn around and say, no, I'm sorry, you can't have it unless you've got a gigantic house. Got it. Yep. There's, there's two parts to that, though, um, and it's lot versus house. And I'm not saying these limits are right, but you know what the problem is here is that people will build <coughs> a, a garage that's bigger than their house five feet from the sideline. Right, exactly. Right, so if you have the 15-foot setback and you're within 10 feet of your principal building, it's considered part of the... Right, that's how, that's how it works, I think. If you're building an accessory building that's within 10 feet of the principal structure, it's considered part of the principal structure. Not in You have to be yes. outside the setback. I, I, that's not how Glenn has. Okay. That's not how I've you seen did that it. Too I, there's once. no <laughs> limit. Yeah. Is that through state? state? That's typical. That's right. I'm pretty right. sure. I'm pretty sure it's in Reading. I'll find it. Find <laughs> it. I was held to that written, once. It's written into the Reading bylaws. Right. So yeah, you're never limited it. to yeah. building whatever you okay. want if you've got room. If you're within 10 feet of your principal structure, you're, you're essentially building it like it was added on, but it doesn't have to be connected, and then you can do whatever you want. So right. that freedom's already there. This is really probably just about maybe lots that are more limited, I think. And I, I'm not disagreeing with you in that we maybe have to be more flexible. I'm just saying it doesn't take away all those rights that already exist for the bigger garages and two-story structures with apartments and whatever else is up there. That's already built in. Okay, because I think there are a number of garages out there that are closer than 10 feet that are detached because it's never been determined what that distance is unless there's a state, I meant to look that up, whether there's a state. I'm mean, pretty sure it's part of IBZ, IBZ, which I thought was the basis for what we have. And I remember it coming up with a structure I was doing. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't know if I've come across that, but perhaps it's there. So that's something that we should look at. Yeah. Anyways. Yeah, I think I think that would be a very good thing to clarify, you know, what the distance is from the back or side of a house that considers it attached uh, or detached, because in the past it's been, you know, is it inches or is it five feet? You know, whatever. I was understood to be. Well, actually, it's in it right there. Such accessory shall be looked at. That's on the side yard. That's from the lot line, not yeah. from the principal no, it's structure. the other way around. And then, yeah, I agree that the 25% could be a, a problem with that uh, based on the existing structure. Yeah. Well, 
So Dave, you're looking at that first aspect, correct? Right. I mean, the, <clears throat> the basic thing that the if it's not a quote accessory building, if it's part of the basically the principal building, you don't have those those constraints. That's right, exactly. You don't. So if it's part of the principal and it's attached, we don't have to worry about it. I don't, there's no problem right. there. This is. I'm just concerned about detached structures. And where it comes into play is that, you know, for example, we'll just take my lot where I am in my neighborhood. They're very narrow lots. Um, we have 80 foot frontages. So, and our house pretty much covers the, the width of that. And so if I want a garage, I have to make it detached. I can't put it on the side of my property because I don't have enough room. But if I put it detached, I have enough length on my property that I could put it at the back without a problem and still get two cars in there and be able to come in and get into the two doors. But because my house is so small, I'm not entitled to be able to do that. You would not be right. if that 25% That's right. were That 25%. Is that something we want to reconsider? Well, I... One second. In the discussion, but... Okay. So we'll come back to that. Um, just a yeah. point of clarification. Um, I don't know if you want to ask town council. There's a um, clarifier in the definition. So it was what you're referring to was in the um, definition of accessory apartment. Yeah, accessory building. Accessory so building. In your current bylaw, you have in your definition of accessory building the following mysterious sentence. <laughs> accessory building located within 10 feet of a principal building shall be subject to the dimensional requirements applicable to the principal building. So that is kind of an, an awkward um, construction because it doesn't say it's not an accessory building. It just says that the dimensional requirements are the same as a principal building. That is not in, in the current proposed rev uh, revision. Um, but it can be. It should be. Well, it, it's it, some version of it can be. Yeah, yeah. Right. That doesn't belong in the definition. Right. That's mm -hmm. the the problem is we tried to remove the regulatory language from the definition. From definition. Right. And, and that constitutes regulatory language. Right. It doesn't belong where it is. Right. But, but it could something like that could appear in the discussion of, of accessory buildings. See what that does, right? Yeah, that and that's fine. I mean, I'm, I I would say that's a good thing. And most towns have 10 feet. Uh, I think Winchester it's 15 feet. That you have any accessory structure has to remain behind or around any principal structure by at least 15 feet. Um, I think Malden might have it too. There's some pretty strict restrictions. Uh, this is actually the opposite of that. This says you get extra credit. You, you get much more flexibility and it's going to be much bigger if you are close to your house within 10 feet of your house. Correct. That's yeah, that's the opposite of what. Except that, well, is that right? But then you'd have to maintain your setbacks at that point in time. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Right. But if you filled in the 10 feet with a breezeway, if you connected it, yeah. it could right. be part of your house. And if it was scaled appropriately, you could do whatever you wanted to. You'd still be outside the setback. And it could just be part of your house. It wouldn't be the garage. Right. So that's why that 10 feet makes sense. Right. All right. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Stephen Crook, uh, Town Meeting Member Precinct 2. To the prior speaker's point on 551B, would something work like shall not be larger than the greater of X square feet or 25% of the floor area? So if I have a, say I have a thousand square foot house and it was greater than 500 square feet or 25%, I could build a 500 square foot accessory structure instead of a 250 square foot accessory structure. So that might help you yeah. with particularly small houses. I don't know what the numbers should be, but that might be a, might be a way. Okay, yeah. I'm not sure what to do <coughs> about roof pitches and, and heights or second stories, though. Right, right. Well, I see the, I see the concern. Okay. Good. Well, thank you for that. And I think we'll come back to 5.5.1b in its entirety and think through that. I think, Tony, you had your hand up first. 
<coughs> Mr. Chairman, Tony DeRezzo, 130 John Street. Uh, while we're on 5.5.1, uh, C, D, and E state, no accessory building or structure shall be located within a required front yard, uh, D is required side yard, and E is required rear yard. I'm trying to figure out what's left. <laughs> Where can we put it? <laughs> well, the, that's a, that it, it, except for the, or the exception in E, um, it means that the, an accessory building must meet the setback requirements. Basically, the required yard is the setback. So the front yard is 20 foot setback, the side yard is 15 foot setback, and the rear yard is, oh, uh, somebody help me out here. <laughs> 15 or 20, 20 foot from the rear line. Well, so now within, that, the within that buildable area, which is not in one of those required yards, you know, an accessory structure is, is permitted. And in the uh, rear yard, it must meet the, the requirements in, in there in paragraph E. So the definition for front yard, side yard, and rear yard are not the definitions for required front yard, rear yard, and side yard. That, and if you go back to definitions, you'll see it's all based on the building as opposed to the lot lines. Correct. The definition tells you where the side yard is, the rear yard is, and front yard dimensional controls by the setback. So it would be the setback, not the, not the side yard. Setback of the side, the side Set, setback. Side setback. Yeah. And then you're given some exceptions here, though, right? You can be within 10 feet of the lot line, and 5 feet from the rear line. So my question is whether you would like to change it from a uh, side yard to a side setback. Okay. We'll come back to that. Okay. Let's do that. <coughs> um, if I could just clarify, going back to the discussion on the 10 feet, that was just in the um, Gateway Smart Growth District zoning, not a definition in Section 2. So the, yeah, just that's to that's clarify. It's not in Section 2. Okay. Um, but it can be. But it can be. <laughs> right, right, okay. And then, Tika. And then uh, some additional comments on that particular section. If you get to G, which I understand has been eliminated, which makes sense since the definition of swimming pools, game courts, and the like are accessory structures, that is defined under the state requirements. So I understand that that's been removed and that makes sense. But I will just say one more thing. You may want to set a setback for those items because. As it reads now, they are considered accessory structures, and under our bylaws, they can be as close as five feet from the setback of the property. So we may want to say for swimming pools, it should be 10 feet instead of five feet, like it is now. And that's, that has been the, that was what it was in the state code that was eliminated. If they no longer set it, a setback for, for pools in the state, state building code. So we may want to set that. I don't know. It used to be 8 feet, and then it went to 10 feet because the state said it couldn't be any closer than 10 feet. Now we're saying it could be as close as 5 feet. Is that something we care about? So I just want to caution you on that one. You may want to consider adding a setback for that. Okay. Same thing with sports courts. You know, do you want a basketball court 5 feet from the property line, or should it be over a little bit more? And then one more thing, it does say under F, fences, that you can't have a fence higher than six feet. Mm -hmm. I would just think that people in the public should be aware that all those gorgeous Walpole woodworking fences that have those nice decorative pieces above would then be non-conforming. So you couldn't do that. If you have a six-foot fence and they put those nice rails above it, you couldn't do that anymore on our property line. You'd have to sit it in five feet or... Whatever it is. Well, what's it define the fence height as? Six feet. Six 
six feet. It says, well, that's the question. Is it? It doesn't define it. Could you define it as solid, and then any of the lattice above is exempt, or so that's it's not defined in here. It just says six foot. Six. Feet. Where is that? It's uh, <coughs> five point five point one f oh, fences right. Right. and line poles. So you're, you're, you're saying that everybody who puts in one of those fences goes and applies for a separate building permit for the fence? If they're over six feet, they would. But those with the lattice, I don't know that they've ever had to have a building because they're not structural. They're just decorative. But the way this reads to me is that you couldn't do that anymore. You couldn't put the cute little, you know, they have the pickets and they have, and they have there's some beautiful fences out there that really make them lovely and still give you the privacy. But now you wouldn't be able to do that on this bylaw without putting it Five feet in, I'm assuming. Well, in once again, I think this is, I mean, state regulation says <coughs> six feet is the. Uh, yeah, but we're saying you can't even do it. Even if you got a permit for it, you couldn't do it on your property line, period, in the town of Reading. And what is it now? Uh, if, if it's over six feet, you need a permit, but you can do it on your property line. There's no restriction on where that fence. They can't go on your neighbors, but. <laughs> right, right. And, and I'm sorry, one more thing with A, I, and I got a note here that says habitable. It says that it cannot be habitable except for accessory apartments. And I want to just make sure we understand that that is, I don't think, fair. Okay, so if we get to accessory apartments, I have another feeling about that. But on this, if, if what we're saying is you can't have a garage that is habitable, or you can't have an accessory structure habitable, that eliminates pool houses, that eliminates, like I said, the, the use of a room above a garage or a rec room or hobby space. So you're eliminating a lot of uses out there. Uh, habitable is defined in the state building code as being a living space, eating, cooking, so if you have a, if you have a yeah, space that's heated, that has an a bathroom accessory in apartment. it. Yeah. But I mean, there's pool houses that can have. Yeah, kitchen. pool houses have. But I don't, I don't think that's the intent there. I don't think that's, that's. That's right, but that's what the, that's what it comes out to. If you say you can't have it habitable, mm -hmm. how can you have a pool house? I don't think that's the intent of the definition of habitable there. Do we default to the state definition if we don't have our own? Uh, you don't necessarily default to the state definition, but um, uh, habitable usually does not mean that it has to be residential. It just means that it, it habitable means that it can be occupied by people. So, um, so uh, what Ms. Toomey is saying is right, building is code correct. read that way. Building yeah. code has building occupiable code. spaces versus habitable type spaces. Well, habitable means somebody can occupy the space overnight, if you will. Living this is order. this is the definition on the IRC. It says a uh, building code definition is, is a space in a building for living, sleeping, eating, or cooking. Uh, bathrooms, toilet rooms, closets, halls, storage, or utility spaces in similar areas are not considered habitable spaces. So if you have it, I mean, to me it says or living, sleeping, eating, or cooking. So if you're in there eating with the table or you have a bathroom in there so you can uh, live there, play there, that's habitable space. So a pool house, in my opinion, is you've got a, you know, you've got a, a bathroom, you've got a, usually there's a small kitchenette in there, you've got tables in there, I mean it's an extension of the pool. So, and unless we define I'm it sorry, a as a neighbor, way. I don't want that 10 feet off my property line. <laughs> Well, then you've got to make a decision as to where it belongs on the property, if that's the case. Somewhere else. I mean, I feel the same <laughs> way about accessory apartments. I don't want an accessory apartment in somebody's backyard either. So I would argue that that's not allowed, that should not be allowed at all in this bylaw. But that's the next discussion. Yep. Any other comments on 5.5.1? Yes, sir. Yeah, Doug Webb, Precinct 1, Town Meeting Member. Um, I guess the question that came up to me was the impetus for the size restrictions on the garage. Being a contractor in town who's built a number of rather large garages with multiple mm -hmm. floors, um, I know that there is demand for them, and you know, 
I built a number of them that look real good, and nobody's had a complaint about them that I know of. And uh, I'm wondering why the size restriction has been put in there, if there's been a big problem, a lot of complaints about oversized garages, or any complaints about oversized garages being built? <clears throat> the thing is that uh, a house with an attached two or three car garage that's multiple story is perfectly legal, perfectly allowed. It's if somebody sticks it on the back of their lot, five feet off the, the rear property line, and, and makes another house, three story, gar you know, three car garage with a uh, carriage house above it. That's currently, I mean, that's what we're trying to um, control. Uh, right, I understand that. Why? Has there been a lot of complaints about those being built? There has been, there have been questions over the period of the last 12 years about the mansionization of garages. You, know, we, you basically have a cape house and you've got a garage next to it which is larger than the cape house. Now, it's, if it's considered a single structure, it's no big deal. But if it's a detached structure closer to the property line than the required setback, that is a zoning issue. The setbacks are trying to protect your neighbors, right? So if you're able to build something as big as your house beyond the setback, then the setback <coughs> have, no, uh, have no meaning. Right, but my question is, how many complaints have we actually have actually been fielded on that? I've done two. I've done both of those. I've built accessory structures that are bigger than the houses that were existing on the property, and I'm just wondering. You know, obviously, it looks like that won't happen in the future if this goes through. But I'm wondering how many complaints have been filed, or you know. Well, but there was no basis for a complaint. Well, then nobody had a problem with it, so why are we trying to change it? No, no. Well, I mean, you're talking about potentially decreasing property values. I don't you know. You buy an S20 or S40 and you start building accessory structures, you know, that, are, that have a particular use next to your neighbor rather than your house. You're infringing on your neighbor's piece of, of, of property that you bought. Well, yeah. One of them was in a, what, how big is that? Huge, right. Huge piece of property, 40,000 square feet. He has a nice, gorgeous barn, and the house is modest house. It's still a beautiful house because it's an older house, but it nobody sees it. So you're telling him he could never do this, even though it sits in the middle of his property. It's behind. It's surrounded by trees, and nobody is around. So why are we restricting that? I guess that's the question. How can we well, allow <laughs> that to happen? If you're outside the set, pure in your setback envelope, you can do whatever you want within the uh, Not as an accessory structure, not the way this reads. The limits of, um, I don't see how that makes this, this is an accessory building. Are we talking about, we're still talking about yeah. the 25% existing. No, we're talking about A, accessory buildings or structures limited to one story. Well, both we're of them, really, because. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we're still looking at that too, though. Yeah. But I, I think that, I think we really need to differentiate between the bigger lots and the smaller lots, and not well, just that say that they're all one thing, because they aren't. But I'm saying what we're doing here is eliminating that from a, even being feasible ever. Don't you already limit the bigger lots and smaller lots by the total lot coverage? Yeah. I think that has come That's up already right. once with the you know maximum doing? lot coverage. Uh, hopefully, we have a new definition for lot coverage because that didn't exist properly before either. I think we do. So anyways, my voice is against the limiting of the size <coughs> in this way and the limiting of the two stories, uh, the limiting of the uh, one or two story structures and the height restriction. Um, you know, a, a, again, you're, you're limiting some of these garages to little squat, ugly looking things that certainly would not be as attractive to the neighbor as what could be a nicely designed garage that would have a, you know, possibly a higher, a higher pitch roof with some storage space or accessory space above it. Um, you know, and I, I think that you're getting into you know, questions of you know, personal appearance in trying to decide what these things are gonna look like just by the size of them. <coughs> so Okay. Yeah, we got we got it. We're gonna come back to that as far as we wanna make any revisions to it. Dave? Just David Trinello is on the Board of Appeals, I can just tell you that we've had a number of applications. Uh, the ZBA surrounding attached and accessory structures uh, and applications for variances from the setback. Um, and we always take a 
hard look about how close those are to the property line. Height, setbacks. So it, it is something that the neighborhood aesthetic cares about and it's and it's also part of the uh, application process uh, when looking at a variance application. So we have seen an increased number of those types of uh, requests for variance. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments on this section? Tony, Tony DeRezzo, 130 John Street. Uh, the end of section 551, uh, I, we have uh, accessory structures allowing a truck trailer used for storage or advertising, a standalone shipping or storage container, or a steel storage unit being allowed in the in all zoning districts, as long as they meet the setbacks. I would propose either we limit that to a temporary as one year, or at least eliminate the word advertising. So how do you guys want to do this? You want to debate these points now, or do we want to keep? Keep moving. Well, and debate it all at the, end. the is there a simple way to to get away from this this accessory building uh, conundrum if we? <laughs> Added, add a word, kind of, sure. to five five one a. Just say accessory buildings or structures uh, located um, I'm, I'm, what is it in the within the setback or <coughs> within the required yard? Okay. And make that that single change to say that the the size and maximum height and so forth applies only to the accessory buildings that are encroach on one of the required yards. And I would propose that it would be either the rear or the side. But if the structure encroaches within one of the required yards, it is restricted as written. I, I agree with that, except I would take away the roof height. If you limit it to one story, there's only so much you can do. There's only so much you can do with that roof. You know, it's, it's, it's going to have a good pitch, but, um, it, it, you know, it can't go, can't go second story and then little mansard on it. Yeah. If, we, okay. if you limit it to one story, I think you've established an eave height, pretty much, and then you're going to pitch the roof to some aesthetic or, you know, drainage criteria. Yeah. Okay. And this is within that within the side yard. This is only within the side yard we're talking about. Well, if the building encroaches into the, oh, the side the yard, yard or required yard. yard, actually. Yeah. <coughs> you want to make that change right here? Yeah. 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 Well, this is our opportunity, I think. Is that a word document? Or? Yeah. Now, I would make the change and see see what it looks like, and then let people comment on it. <coughs> we have the document. All right, so that that's a proposal for a. What about B? I, I think like the proposal that had a minimum size and then left the twenty five percent of some maximum. Okay. So to what I think. So what Steve size? What size do you typically see for a two-car garage? Well, two-car garage minimum is 24 by 24. You just can't. Nowadays, with the cars being the way they are, you need two nine-foot doors or a large door to get something in there, and that seems to be the standard. And I've seen them at 20 by 20, but most of them, 
you know, they're just not long enough or wide enough to get anything else in there other than a car. So I would say 24 by 24, which is how much for, that's that 506 square feet, so say 600 square feet. Yeah. I think so. Yeah, yeah. And we're not worried about the loft. Yeah, you don't want to stay total area. Or no, no. Area. no. Yeah. Figure that out. But it's 25% of the strip of the entire house, all floors. Is that gross square I don't know. I don't know how we're going to work that 25 year. I think the idea so is to set. A house, you count all three floors, and then take 25% of that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I guess. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I don't think the 25% was intended to be the footprint. I think it was intended to be the, the, the floor area, yeah. the total floor area. It's funny to me that somebody with a tall thin house could have a bigger garage than somebody with a short fat house. <laughs> That's what you're saying. Stop building ugly houses. <laughs> Did you get that, Gene? Yep. And the, roof? A required yard. and the removal of one story? Can you zoom in on that a little bit? No. You want to limit it in one story and remove the height restriction, right? Right. Oh, I'm sorry. That's what I was proposing. One story. And then the definition. Oh, I see. I see. I'm sorry. You're right. You're right. The rest of that sentence. Yeah. All right. So let's come back to B and let's look at A and see okay. how that reads and if that's getting to what our intent is. <coughs> Can you zoom in just a bit so that it's yeah. legible? Thank you. Bottom right. Yeah, and the other the other thing that we might want to change in that particular paragraph would be to uh, change the word habitable to say accessory buildings shall not provide residential space except for accessory apartments. Mm -hmm. I don't know, that yeah. mm -hmm. Let's try. Why do we have to even say whether they're habitable or not? I guess I don't understand. I mean, obviously if they're accessory apartments, they have to be habitable too. But what are we trying to... Read, read the result here. We're not talking about habitable. <laughs> so what's residential space? Well, you know what we're trying to do here, right? We're trying to prevent people from building a second house, you know, the back of their own land. Yeah, unless no, I realize that, but unless I guess. it's zoned as an accessory apartment. So you had a problem with the word habitable because you felt that it, it covered even spaces where you are occupying them. Now, I had a problem because I wanted to be able to make them habitable. <laughs> I think there are a lot of people who want them to be habitable. But that's that's, that right. goes through the accessory mm -hmm. apartment. Not necessarily mm -hmm. for it. Go ahead. <laughs> Point of clarify. I got Tom Wines, South Street. Not necessarily, right? I mean, what she's saying, accessory is very thinly defined use. You have to have a kitchen, you have to have a bathroom, you have to have a bedroom, you have to have a living room. What she's asking for. That's accessory apartment. Yeah. Yes, and that's what accessory use or accessory building. This is all accessory buildings. Right, this is all accessory buildings. But when you say it's not habitable, it means you can't do anything in there. No, right. that's not what I'm trying to get at. Well, that's what we're it's just we're, we're It's semantics over the word habitable versus occupiable. Okay. What I'm saying is I want to be able to have the full house that might have a kitchen. I just don't want it to be an apartment that somebody lives in full time unless they go through the accessory apartment route. So right now, habitable is tied to that the ability to live in that structure. Because the only definition we have out there is the one on the state code. Put only in front of that. So we're trying to eliminate that restriction that lets you, you know, so you can use it to eat in, hang out in, buy a pool or whatever, or have a workshop in, not live in. Thank you. 
this this is this is it. That's the that's a good way. That's, that's the positive a perfect approach. way. Yeah. That's a good way. <laughs> there. <laughs> required yard is that one of the setback yards? Yes. If I'm no, not no, one of the no. setbacks, I can. Time out. Time out. <laughs> yeah. We have yard requirements: front yard requirements, side yard requirements, and rear yard requirements. Right. Those are strips of land mm -hmm. in the front, side, and rear that have to be kept basically clear, except for certain certain um, exceptions. Yep. The word setback refer in this in this zoning bylaw the word, the word setback refers to the actual distance from a building to some other point, which could be the property line or it could be uh, a neighboring zoning district or it could be something else. That's that's how the word setback is used. So when we talk about required yards, we're talking about those little strips. We're not saying the whole area that's, that constitutes the setback, because that's from the house to the street, is the, is the front setback. That's, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the more limited yard. Yeah. It, but it, at the same time, it's true that the minimum setback, as described in the dimensional requirements, defines the required yard. Right. It's, you know, there's no good way to. <laughs> we're there. Well, the point of the yeah, I think reason I asked the question. Sorry, I just raised my, got to raise my hand. Is the point of it is clarification and and making it simple for those of us that don't do it every day to understand, right? The required yard is not defined in the definitions, and it seems like we have. Yeah. Isn't there? See if we got little rear drums. yard, remote repair. Research, but no required. And that would be perfect for a picture, since you have so many pictures in there. Required yard with pictures would show what you mean by required yard versus rear yard, <coughs> side yard, front yard. Okay. That's the setback. Yeah. That they don't have required guards. Why not this their definition of sentence? Where's our dimensional table? No, setbacks doesn't hear you. Yeah, required yard is a definition. I know what setback is. Yeah. So if I were to draw a picture of a square, you go through the rear yard, George. Right? You don't have to talk through some of those things. Okay, so we'll get that. One second, Tom. We we got that. We'll, yeah. We're gonna we'll address that. We'll get that added. Thank you for that. Hold on. I think Megan had her hand up first. Thank Go ahead. You, Megan Young, Forty Oak Street. Um, question: Did we ever consider adding setback to the definitions, or is it in here somewhere and I haven't gotten to it yet? Jeff, it is in there. What area is it in? Under definitions. Under definitions. No, it's not. No, it's, it's not in. They have, this is, oh, this is okay. All right, so to clarify, <laughs> I added it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I agree with you. It needs a definition. Okay, and and so the definition changes I provided before are they in the new version? I gave all your comments to okay. um, to council. So the comments related to facility versus establishment. We made a lot of those changes to try and make it consistent with facility. Perfect. Where it was. Um, and, and and speaking to setback, just as a thought, um, Belmont had a really nice definition of setback and pictures of front and rear setbacks that I think would be a nice addition since we're putting um, pictures in. And also to the gentleman's point earlier that for people who don't know, mm -hmm. um, it's a nice guideline. Yep. Okay. I don't know. It just okay. is a consideration. So in the Belmont zoning bylaw, they use setback setback to to mean yard. Um, okay. So, oh. uh, well, so I tried the, that and they shot me down. Uh, okay, so I mean, there's so the definitions of you know they have a rear setback, a front setback. Those are similar to the definitions we have for yard. Okay, and and for and 
the point of clarification so the there is what? What's the difference between, why did they go one way versus us going another way? What's the difference for those who don't know? The Dave, you wanted to go that way. Is that the building inspector uh, for the town of Reading is the zoning enforcement officer and he uses the term yard. All right, so we're going, that, that makes sense. So we're going with our conventional way that we call things out. Yeah. Okay. If Thank there, there's, I don't even know whether I could say that one term is favored over another. It's okay. It could, but it, and that's actually nice to know that it could be either or. Yes. Okay. But as long as you define something. Right. Right. All right. Good. Tony, you had your hand up. Uh, uh, Marcy, did you have a comment? No. I, I hate to kill this one, but could somebody show me the dimensional controls for an accessory building? Where they are in the new bylaw? Are you suggesting they're not there based on your review? I can't <laughs> find them. <laughs> okay. I can find principal buildings, but I can't find accessories. Okay. I don't think it's in there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure that we exactly had them before. We they didn't. Were sort of in Section 5, mm -hmm. scattered. They were brought up to the <coughs> new Section 5.5.1. <coughs> but to that point, we really didn't have anything before, so that's where the idea about the height came in. Mm -hmm. That's where the idea with the 25% um, so size limitation came at in. At this so point, there is no accessory use allowed in the required rear, back, side yard, or the setback. Correct? Mm -hmm. uh, what was the question? The setback changes based upon the use of the structure. At this point, there can be no principal or accessory building in either the setback or the required yard, whatever you would like to call it. So your definition where you changed, I want to say A, so that if it was in the setback, had to be shorter, doesn't exist. What? Mm -hmm. I don't I'm understand. I'm confused. I'm confused too. What do you suggest? How do you suggest we address this? Do, do you think it needs to be added to this to I, I to think the you, table? You, if you're going to allow for accessory uses that can encroach upon the setbacks, then you have to add them to your dimensional control. That is all. Okay. Let's, um, we'll, we'll consider that for sure. Sorry, I'm forgetting your name, but I know you have your hand up. Uh, Doug Webb, uh, Doug. Precinct 1, Town Meeting Member. Um, I don't know where we are, I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm looking at trying to tie this through and get to the accessory building locations and so forth, and then referring back to the definitions of side yard on page 13, and it appears to me that the drawing does not match the text for what a side mm -hmm. yard is. You're right. We, oh, you've got yes. that already. We're going to fix yes. this. Yes. We have it already. Yes. Come in late. This no, no, no. <laughs> no, no. You're not late. Okay. So I can put a bold men pen mark. Yeah. yeah. And you yeah. sent an email earlier, correct? Did I see an email from no. you? No. Oh, I think it was somebody else. But oh, that's, yeah, we, we're going to get that corrected. Um, I think it's under um, definition. It's under right. a different so you, part. So um, which one are you changing there? Is you changing the depth, the verbiage or the picture? The picture. Okay, but we don't, he doesn't have what it's changed to yet. I don't know. Do we have the new picture up? Yeah. There it is. Yeah. Okay, right. Sense. Which is the way it's always been. Yeah. 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 Right. Okay. <coughs> That's not right? Well, the, the side so yard. Your side it yard. doesn't necessarily go all the way to the house. Right. Well, of course it does. Well, the kids right. play in the side yard all the time. The, the, the rear yard is it's 20, feet, feet, it's 20 feet from here. Oh, yes. Not all the way up to the house. The required yard. <laughs> That's the required, the required yard. yard. The required yard. That's why I was asking the question. Yes. Required yard. Yes. Yes. But the, the, but the not defined yard. Of yard. Okay. Got it. That's where there's. Right. A little confusion. Right. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So you're saying the definition of yard was in? No, not the definition. The picture associated with it is incorrect. Yes. No, I'm saying no. it's correct. Yeah, no, no. Correct. Now picture, it's correct. That picture okay. matches at least the definition right. that you've, yeah, you've given there. The okay, so we're good on that right. one. So sure. you could draw actual different lines on there that would show the side possibility of required side, rear, and front yards. 
Am I correct? Yes, it would sure. be at 15, 20, 20. Sure. Yes. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Too bad you don't have like a grease board in here that we could actually draw this on. So that well, is a grease board right No, we didn't. Oh, is it? <laughs> <laughs> it's a smartboard or something yeah, like that. I'll wipe that out. But, <laughs> but on John, I know it was chalkboard, actually. Oh, right, so that. you could put lines, we could put lines on there right now that would show the difference between the rear yard and the required rear yard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, right, it's, you don't have a definition for required. I think no, we said it's we called were minimum. Gonna we're going to add that. You are. Okay. I mean, yeah. in, the, yeah. in the table of dimensional control, 6.3, it's minimum front yard, minimum side yard, minimum rear yard. Right, so you're changing the picture also on rear yard then? Yes. And the well, because, all the pictures because we change. put all the yard words together, we just have one picture. Instead of having the same picture, more, more than one yard. Oh, you did change that? Yeah. Okay, that was going to be one of my comments. Really so wait, let, let's stop for a second. I feel like we've resolved 5.5.1a. Where did we end up? We were talking about 600 square feet for 5.5.1b. Is that something we can develop on the fly, or do we need to do some research and make a proposal? Well, I think I think the uh, what was being proposed was something on the order of. 600 square feet or 25%, whichever is greater. Nancy? I, I'm is sorry, that I, I was <laughs> not focusing. Say it again, I apologize. 600 square, rather than have it be just 25%, have it be 600 square feet or 25% of the floor area, whichever is greater. Gross floor, Gross Gross floor area. Of the principal structure, whichever is greater. I guess, I mean, I think that's, more equitable. It may, basically, it means if you have a, a 3,500 square feet house or more, you could have three cars. Anything less than that, you couldn't have a three car garage, even though we allow a three car garage in our zoning. So that's the limit. So you're a saying detached you have, three car garage. Yeah, exactly. You can have two cars detached, you could have one car detached in any property in Reading, but you couldn't have three cars unless you had a house. It has nothing to do with the size of the lot, it has to do with the size of the house. Mm -hmm. That's right. So I don't know if that makes sense. I mean, you're still not <coughs> making it associated. How many, how many people who want a three-car garage want to walk from the garage to their house? I've got a couple Gee. of three-car I mean, you can't. Gross floor. The, the difficulty is you don't have the land in Reading to attach a three-car garage. So the only way to do it is to do it as a detached garage. There's right. actually quite a few of them. You were right? talking about like a shotgun um, land lot. Well, yeah, well, which are most of our, most of our lots are 80 feet across. I mean, so, and you need turning radius to get into those garages. So the only way to go to them is just to go straight, right? Is you need at least 30 feet to get a car to turn. So the ones that have attached and gone long, <laughs> the, you still need 30 feet on the side to be able to come down and make that turning radius, unless you take up your whole backyard and pave it. So, I, I mean, that's up to you. I, I, I live in Reading. I don't want necessarily to see these gigantic, huge, ugly garages there. I, I'm with you on this. I just think you have to be a little bit more realistic about what we have in Reading for lots. And yeah, and, and if, if somebody so. has an S20 lot with a lot of flat land, they can have a three-car garage. As long as they have a house that's 3,500 square feet or more is what you're telling me. No, that's for a three structure. They probably will. <laughs> just put it within 10 feet of the house. Yeah, right. How do you get into it? That's oh, not if you're in the problem. back, if you're talking about a lot that's limited in width and there's depth to it, then it's going to be in the back regardless. I would say to you that A probably takes care of a lot of it because now you're saying that unless it's, you know, inside of the setbacks, right, I, and you have a house, a lot that's fairly small, you're not going to be able to fit a three-car garage in that lot area. Or I mean, I don't know. I. I'm very nervous about tying it to a specific size. I really am. I'm not sure that that's going to serve as well, but I would at least say 600 square feet is the minimum. Is, is it 600 square feet gross floor area of the accessory structure or 600 square feet and what area are we talking about for gross floor area of the principal structure? Right, you're saying 600 square feet gross area, that's not enough because if you have a second no, story. I'm going to put gross floor area on yeah. the garage. 
and the garage portion of it. 600 square feet. Footprint? Footprint. 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 Yeah. Yeah. That's the 24 by 24 we were talking about. Right. Okay. No, I'd say uh, foot footprint. footprint. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess if, unless floor area is defined strictly as the single footprint floor area versus gross floor area. Well, basically, no accessory structure building uh, may have a footprint larger than 600 square feet or 25 percent. Yeah, we have a gross floor area definition as the sum of all the floors. And we have a net floor area, but we don't have a floor area or footprint. So I think if we said either floor area or footprint, we'd lose the B. Okay. Well, you have to define the footprint. Right. You use footprint and you define it. Okay. You can do that. More comfortable with that? But yeah, I, I would, if you have to put something in, I would definitely say you want to make a minimum of 600 because that makes sense to me. It gives somebody at least the opportunity to have two cars on their property if they have the room for it and they want it. Okay. Uh, Go ahead, Ray. Uh, I was going to ask Jean to put up the definition of, it, mm -hmm. of accessory uh, building from but she needs to finish what she's doing. Yeah. Okay. She can do that. Okay. What one consequence of this? You have to right. find, and we and Turn we have to get to detached accessory apartments. We find the minimum of a detached accessory apartment is 750 no. square feet. No, so maximum. this would allow at least a 600 detached accessory apartment. No, the no. the no. maximum for a detached that, accessory. I'm sorry, right. Yeah. But if we tie it back to that 25 percent again. So the only people who could have a 750 square foot accessory apartment now has to have a house that's over 3,600 square feet, or whatever the three times. That's the maximum. Though. But that's, that was, yes. Okay, and if you're fine with that, that's fine. I mean, I don't, <coughs> as I said, I'm, I'm really less right. interested in having detached accessory apartments on people's property. But that, just so you know, that, that's the. Okay. You're allowing 600 square foot accessory apartments on any property with this definition. Mm -hmm. So let's make sure that the language here is what you mean. Footprint can't be larger than 600 square feet. Right. Or the footprint can't be larger than 25% of, of what? The floor area. Which well, floor area? Of gross, of gross floor area. Gross floor area. Gross. Okay. But you were going to do footprint compared to gross floor area, right? Okay. Well, limited by, yeah, not compared to, per se. But. Got it. I just wanted to make sure that we were, we were making the right comparison. Now, okay. can we look at the gross floor area definition? Because as I read it, that includes even unfinished basements, if they can be habitable or made habitable. Is that your intent on that definition? I'm sorry, I should raise my hand, but I'm talking. Intended for occupancy or storage. It's your entire house. So you can count <coughs> your basement, basement to attic. and attic. If it's allowed to be occupied, that it's got the right height, Headroom, all the requirements that go along with making that occupiable. Okay. Yep. Okay. Okay. That's good. Now, if you could just yeah. have it. Habitable. habitable. No. Now, if you could, because you can have storage in the basement that's not habitable. Well, that's true, right? Or and storage. an attic that's not habitable, but it's still attic. We don't use the term habitable. We use occupancy or storage. Intended for occupancy or storage. Or storage. So that includes attics itself. I mean, that's everything. Okay, all right, so that increases the Right, because your bathrooms are not habitable, they're occupiable. Yeah. <laughs> Steve, did you have a question <laughs> or a comment before? I saw your hand come up. Um, no, I had the, I had this, the suggestion that if it was not a footprint, you might now end up with a, a two-story garage where you have 300 square foot 
first floor to 300 square foot, second floors to the 600 square foot two story structure. Well, Assuming somewhere else you allowed two stories. So footprint makes sense. Okay. Yes, please, Ray. I want, Jean, if you don't mind, yep. going up to the definition of accessory building that's, that's in the text, in section two. There it is. Okay. Note, the definition says that it's customarily incidental and subordinate to. So some of the things that have been described so far as you could have a little house and a great big garage, those things should not be regarded as accessory buildings at all because they're not subordinate. Mm -hmm. So there, there is a, an, another restriction that exists anyway. So when, when they're talking about what, what can happen um, outside of the required yards, or, you know, in the, inside, in the building envelope, um, it's not unlimited. It still has to be subordinate. Which, I, think, I think it's fair, yeah. I think it's defining what's subordinate, you know, how much is it subordinate, that's how things that we're struggling with. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead, George. Uh, like a point of order, we have a good momentum today, and we'll be discussing this topic for one hour and 15 minutes. I think many people have come for accessory apartments, and my suggestion is to move on quickly while we are still awake and have still this energy. <laughs> to discuss some of the primary topics of this meeting. Let's go. Not to degrade what we're seeing, which is really important and technical, and there's good information, but I think we need to look at how to invest the time of sure. good turnout, because I don't know when the next one might be. Okay, thank you. Let's do that. Go ahead, Marcy. I would just say, I, I think that um, if people want to know about accessory apartments, we want them to bring up their questions and to have the opportunity to address those concerns and see if we need to make any changes here as opposed to on the floor of town meeting. It's just, it's better to, to do it earlier. I sure. Think. So I, I agree that we need to get to all of everything, but we want to make sure we give people a full opportunity to talk about accessory apartments because we know that piece is changing and we want people to have that input. Yep. All right, so what comments do we have on accessory apartments? Where do we want to start there? Yeah, go ahead, Angela. Um, <coughs> Angela Binda, town meeting member, precinct five. Um, I have some comments about accessory, and some questions about accessory apartments. Um, to start with, uh, it just the purpose of accessory apartments subject to the terms and offer means of increase increasing the number of lower cost dwellings without causing adverse. There have been a lot of discussions on why we have it, so I would like that purpose to actually better reflect, I think, what a lot of the discussions have been about it. So I have a suggested change for that. that says this section authorizing the terms and limitations is intended to increase the range of housing accommodations in the town by increasing the number of small dwelling units increase greater diversity of population with particular attention to adults and seniors, and to encourage a more economic use of the town's housing supply while maintaining the appearance and character of the town's one-family neighborhoods. I've written that out if you want Just to see that afterwards. And also, um, the definition, I, um, again, the definition, an accessory apartment is second dwelling unit subordinate in size to the principal dwelling on the lot located in either the principal dwelling or the existing accessory structure. I noticed when I was reading this through that the definition is the only place, I think, in the whole bylaw where it, it's mentioned that an accessory apartment can be part of um, an accessory use building. So it's, so it's sort of implied in a lot of places, but I don't think it's really actually stated anywhere and in 5.4.8.2, where you have restrictions, I, I thought that chart was a little confusing because you have pre-existing attached, principal single-family dwelling, yeah. pre-existing detached, but you don't actually say, um, you know, principal single-family dwelling and then um, accessory building. So I thought that that was a little confusing. You're talking about the graphic? 
the graphic yeah, 5.8.2 is, is confusing because you don't actually say anywhere. You do say in L for an accessory apartment located in the carriage house, stable, barn, or other detached, but there's really no other place where you talk about an accessory apartment being located in an accessory building except right there, but you don't actually say it. Um, I do, I noticed that you changed the new construction attached from um, by right to special permit. I think that that is a very good change that you made. Um, I think these graphics are very difficult to understand. That was mentioned at the, Z, the ZAC that they're being changed because you can't tell what's on a right. side lot. Yeah, we're going to get those um, changed. As far as the performance standards go, I have, um, I have a couple questions about a couple of things. One is um, confusion with the driveway parking lot in G. Um, the location and the appearance of shall not adversely affect adjoining properties of the single family character of the neighborhood in general. I think that's a very good thing. Only one access driveway may be authorized provided. However, an additional driveway may be authorized by the Board of Selectmen. I'm wondering what criteria they use because I know that one of the things that you talked about in all of this was really um, coming up with sort of um, criteria for evaluating how things would be judged and being less subjective. So I'm wondering if there is some criteria for, and I still don't understand why this goes to the Board of Selectmen. I understand that they are in charge of curb cuts, but once it's on the, you know, once you're talking about a driveway into the backyard, I don't understand, but that, I don't, that doesn't matter. But, it, but I'm wondering what, what criteria they use or how that is, um, how that is um, evaluated. And then I guess I have a question with M, and this was brought up at the, at the ZAC too. Um, the special granting authority may grant a waiver from the standard requirements set forth in paragraphs L, A through L inclusive where necessary to install features to facilitate access and mobility for disabled persons. And I guess my only question is, again, is there any sort of criteria for changing that? And there was discussion about whether or not ADA requirements come into it, or I think I read somewhere, and I'm not sure where I read it, that if you, like if you qualify for a, um, a handicapped car, mm -hmm. but, may, you know, but somebody might be older and not be driving, but I, I don't know. But I'm just wondering what the um, what the criteria is for evaluating that. Um, I can't imagine that if somebody came to the ZBA and said I had an elderly mother-in-law, that anybody would say, oh, you know. Yeah. I, so, so I guess I guess I'm just wondering. Um, I'm wondering about that and. Um, So those are my big questions. I know a lot of people, but as far as the purpose, there was a lot of talk about the uh, about the purpose of accessory apartments, and really a lot of the discussion was about elderly people and and, and not so much providing low income. So I did write these out if you want to okay. look at yeah, thank you. the proposed changes. But those are those are my questions. Are we getting rid of or are we keeping them in? Did we? Okay, that's fine. Are you talking for each individual? Yeah, yeah, yeah I know we have a purpose at the beginning. You know, there was discussion about removing them from the subsequent sections. Are we doing that? No, what we're doing is we're tying. Um, so. We're tying it to the purposes of the zoning bylaw. So, 5471, okay. there it is. See, this section is intended to promote the purposes of the zoning bylaw as set forth in section 1.0 by providing. So, it, so it, tie, it, we're not removing them, we're simply tying it to the overall purposes okay. of the zoning. That makes sense. Okay. Okay. 
since since those were rejected at town meeting, um, right, we got a little bit of disconnect, but presumably we'll clean those up and uh, give them another shot. Mm -hmm. But sure. it does it does say in the beginning that a means of increasing the number of lower cost dwelling units. And I think from all of the discussions that I heard at many meetings, people were talking about increasing um, options, sure. primarily for older people. It wasn't necessarily about lower cost. It was providing elderly. So I thought that if, if it were in there, that it would, you know, that if you were going to put something in there, that it should really reflect what people's discussion, you know, what, what was stated as the purpose for this. And it wasn't just about lower cost dwellings. It was more about providing options yeah. for a greater number of people. I've got, I like this. I've got no problem okay. with this at all. And, and, and then again, there's no place in here really that talks about accessory apartments in, I mean, it's, you kind of know it, but you don't actually state it anywhere about the difference between, you talk a lot about single family dwelling, single family dwelling. You don't actually, you know, aside from that chart, which really doesn't say it, I mean, I kind of know what it means, but it's really unclear. So I thought, if you were just picking this up and reading this, you wouldn't really know that you could have an accessory apartment in a accessory building, unless you were reading about, mm -hmm. you know, unless it, I mean, you talk about a carriage house, stable barn, or other detached structure. And again, you talked about Lexington, and Lexington very clearly states, you know, three categories of accessory apartments, by right accessory apartments, special permit accessory apartments, and accessory structure apartments. So they clearly define the three types of the way they have it, and they outline what you need for a by right apartment, an accessory apartment, and an accessory structure apartment. And, and I thought that if one of the points is to really be clear about it, then that really is much clearer, I thought, the way it's written and the way the three things are, are outlined. Because I thought that chart that you have is a little confusing as to what you're referring to. Like a new construction pre-existing in a principal family dwelling. Well, are you talking about building a new house with a, you know, it's, it's a little ambiguous that 5.4.8.2 chart. Okay, got it. <clears throat> and, and then I guess my big question is just when you have something about where you can bypass what's in here, what are the criteria that will be used to judge how that goes? Thank you. Sure, thank you. What other comments do we have? Megan, your hand was up first. Go ahead. Um, Jeff, I was just wondering, with the accessory apartments, and I know with accessory buildings and structures, it has its own, it starts out at 5.5. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if there was any reason, or like just to pull out accessory apartments on its own, similar to accessory buildings or structures. I didn't know really, and I figure you guys have a reason for why you kept it in there, but I just to find it, as far as user friendly, I was wondering, if it could be similar, like its own section too, or was there a reason why it wasn't? Do you know what I mean? I, so if you look at accessory I, buildings, it, it you talk about it, and then accessory apartment seems to have its own kind of conversation too. Yeah. And I didn't know whether you wanted to pull it out or not. I just thought it would be, as far as user friendly, especially finding it, it would be easier to find. I don't know if that matters. I also wanted to say I agree with Angela. I had a concern about the whole low cost or lower cost dwelling um, language, and I really did like like what Jean stated, which she showed accessory apartments. I don't think I think maybe it was maybe one of them was lower cost dwelling, but it was a lot about uh, things other than lower cost dwellings, which made me think. I started going the wrong way, like I was thinking, oh, maybe that they're referring to affordable housing, but it's nothing like it. Accessory apartments don't apply at all to that. Right. So that's where the language I just wanted to say for me too, it pulled me the yeah, wrong way. Purpose, got you. Okay. Hey, yeah, George. I have a question for town council. So the so just the language that uh, was read before by Angela. I'm sorry, the what that was read before? The suggested language that okay. was read before. Mm -hmm. Purpose? 
but that what you're saying? Here. Does, does this uh, offer um, a, a, a tool, a tool to ZBA for those applications but that might try to ask for variances or special permits outside of what we're trying to do? We try to push the envelope to get variances for specific conditions that go beyond what we're trying to do here to control the performance standards. You know, we're trying to prescribe how this might happen. We know that there will be, there might be discussion in town meeting, or you know, there is the mere reality of how our lots are that some people will try to push the limit here. Does Angela's purpose? raise this issue at the level such that ZBA might latch onto it and have reasons to deny those permits. Mr. Chair, I just made a uh, suggested edit that we call it increasing housing options without causing adverse effects. That's yeah, I think five. that's a better way to say it. Yep. Excellent. Okay. Okay. We're done? <laughs> <laughs> So uh, again, so, did you think that bringing it on its own would make sense? Bringing accessory it's apartments. A, it's a subsection of accessory buildings. One uses. Of the uses. And the reason accessory buildings is not within that is why. What is this it is a use, own? and the other is a structure. That was something that used to mess up the old cool. the current code. All right. Uses versus. Nice. So it's accessory use, use versus, versus accessory structure. building. Structure. Mm -hmm. building. Structure. Yeah. Building. Got yeah. it. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, very good. I'm trying. <laughs> to, to, this is a question that just came up. You you changed that. And you were trying to say that these are improving housing options for low cost units. I think is what I heard. We just changed it. No. Right. Yeah. Is that? What you ended up saying, or I, no. I couldn't find it in school. No, we just said increasing housing, housing options. Okay. Increasing yeah. housing period. Yeah. Okay. Without limiting it in any particular. There okay. It is. Right. If and because that wouldn't tie in anything to low cost housing and. We got rid of it. See, it's okay. up on the thing. Um, section five point four point eight point three, A and I. Don't they say the same thing? And has one of them already been eliminated? And I'm on an old copy. <coughs> right. Say the number again. Performance standards 5.4.8.3, A and I. Is there a difference between apartment and accessory? Because it says only one accessory apartment per lot can be created, and that's in A. And then it says there shall be no other apartment on the lot in which accessory apartment is located in I. Yeah, that we got rid of. You did. Uh, Here's the new version. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Everything good. I just picked up off the chair then is sorry. Oh, well, right. The new version. Well, it's not. I know. You know, we we got comments as late as this morning yeah. that we tried to incorporate. Right. Anything that came in after say noon, probably not here. So but the I and J totally gone. Accessory apartments? Yes. Okay, yes. good. Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> I know. 5.4.8.3. B. You've defined an accessory apartment that it can be as no more than one third, may, shall occupy no more than one third of the gross floor area of the principal single family dwelling on the lot. But then you say, you say gross floor, then you exclude based upon your definition of gross floor area garage, unfinished basement, shed, or other accessory use structures. So you've just, you've changed the definition to, to limit it in this particular case. Now, am I reading this correctly, that if I increase the size of my house, say my house is small, so I can only get a 400 square foot apartment, but I can add on to make it 750 provided that the total gross floor area of my house also increases to allow it. So I'd need a, again, going back to that threshold of, well, I guess in here it doesn't matter, but I, I guess I'm trying to figure out what one third is. So one third of my house, if my gross floor area of my house is 1,800 square feet, I could only have an apartment that's a third larger. Than, square feet. Yeah, right. Yeah. But if I add it on, well, then I could have more, but I have to add on enough that the total gross floor area gets me to the 750. Mm -hmm. Is that right? That's mm -hmm. right. Okay. 
Yeah, of course you need. So it's a little quirky in there. Because it's new construction, you would require a special permit. Right. Well, oh, for even an addition, you need a special permit. Well, oh, yeah. I mean, if, if it's new construction for the purpose of creating an accessory apartment, then. Okay. Um, and we never answered George's question. Just. Uh, I'm forgetting <laughs> what was George's question. Well, what George's question was whether the purpose that Angela had written would give some criteria for ZBA to establish um, a set of uh, set of criteria, I guess, to come up with, um, make decisions on accessory parts. Provide, yeah, suitable guidance, if you want. Mm -hmm. Close to that level. Well, I'm not ha I'm not fond of special permit granting authorities writing regulations that have substantive standards in them. Um, so I wouldn't want to see a set of regulations that went beyond procedure. You know, this is what the application needs to look like, this is what the plans need to look like, whatever. I, do, I would not encourage ZBA to riff off of, of um, the purpose and establish new approval criteria by regulation. But certainly the purpose is there to um, to guide their decision making when they're when they're applying um, the special permit um, standards. And um, so in that sense it factors into their decision making. But I wouldn't want to see that written into a regulation. Do you have substantive standards they belong in the zoning bylaw? That's why we have a bylaw. George, does that make sense? Uh, um, I, I think, I, if I understand you correct, I agree, provided that we're doing something which protects the town regardless of who's manning the ZBA, because times may change and we're trying to do something zoning, right? We're mm -hmm. looking at 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to do the right thing regardless of who's in the ZBA or what the majority is. So is the question is, is a technical question that can be seen politically, but I want to stick it to the technical aspect. Is this intent, the purpose, high enough grounds for ZBA to deliberate on particular cases where they have to look at these adverse effects? Well, mm -hmm. isn't that well, in our you, master plan too? I mean, we, have, we have this language in our master plan, I'm sure we do. Yeah, I mean, the, the ZBA is dealing with, in the case of a variance, they're, they're dealing with uh, the, the four criteria. And I, I can never remember what they are. You know that by heart. Uh, but this is not a variance. This yeah, special this permit, that's, this is the beauty of this. Okay, right. yeah. So it. just to give you an example, if we were to say that I'm fixing the house and I'm adding four feet to make it better, but I want to have it under existing. We were discussing before the addition versus existing, like as an mm. example. And someone will say, well, I'm only adding four feet to facilitate that. But, and that may be, you know, it's, I mean, it's new construction, but, the, you know, the, the reality is that it exists. <coughs> you know what I'm, I'm trying to do? It's like try to see what is the, if there is something at the high level that can give them some immunity, basically. Mm -hmm. no. Okay. That's it. I think, that, I think the performance standards are the standards. The purpose is there so that if you need to interpret the performance standards in some way, um, you, you, the purpose maybe helps you, helps to guide you some. Um, and since the purpose here is, is to increase housing options, I, I can't think of an example where applying the performance standards would, would denigrate from that purpose, but in a particular case, somebody might want to make a case and maybe that's something that you could think about. But basically, the performance standards are the criteria. And the purpose colors that, but only ever so slightly. So does any of that assist with your question, Angela? Well, I'm okay, but I'm still asking, what are, what are the <coughs> criteria by which if somebody said, I, I need to have the door on the front of the house, 
because I need a driveway that goes right up to the front of that the front door because my mother-in-law has a bad knee. Okay. I mean, that, you know, what what are the what 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 are the criteria for uh, which okay. that would be evaluated? That section that what is that section? Hold on, let him. Let yeah. Right. Go ahead. Yeah. Right. yeah. So here's the deal. The section three of the zoning act prohibits the town from applying its zoning in any way that would discriminate against handicapped people. So we don't want to write criteria here. This is the wiggle room provision so that when we have to deal with a particular situation involving a particular handicapped person, we're not um, stymied. We're only, we're only going to do this to accommodate them, but they have to tell us what, you know, I mean, the handicapped people come in in um, a big variety. We don't want to specify they've got to show this amount or this amount or this amount. You, this is just a provision that's there to keep us out of court so that we can make little adjustments and mm -hmm. don't have to defend cases that allege that we're discriminating against handicapped people. Okay, good. Thank you. Sir. Hi, uh, Mike Webb, 224 Wallen Street. I went to the board to further clarify the, uh, the, the access driveway. I'm still unclear on this. Um, it basically says that only I want access driveway be authorized and I will have to change an accessory apartment. Provided, however, that an additional access driveway will be authorized by the board of selectmen. Now, the ZBA is a special permit granting authority, correct? So they're charged with enforcing the zoning laws? No. No? No. no? Yeah. So who's going to enforce these performance standards on this? What, what board? This one. Section well, 5.4.8.3 yeah. performance standard G. Mm -hmm. what the, the, the thing is that the, the ZBA is not an enforcement agency. Well, I thought, I thought they were charged with basically with interpreting and, and, and enforcing the, uh, the zoning laws. Am I incorrect in that? No. Um, David? Well, you're, you're probably, they're charged with applying them when they're issuing permits. Correct. Okay. Enforcement is for the building inspector. All right. Okay? But what you mean okay. is what you mean is that they're responsible for interpreting this provision when they're issuing a special permit. Okay, I understand. Right? You. So they're the ones that charge with, with issuing a permit. Right. right. Okay, so but what I don't understand is, does the Board of Selectmen also have that? No, it's Authority? just the road. It's, it's they just own the roads. They own the roads. I understand that, right. And you can't, This what this says is, you can't have an extra driveway unless the board, right. board I'm asking, are there going to be two boards that are going to consider zoning relief no, on, on a driveway? It's not zoning relief, it's only a matter of curb cuts. It says right here, it's a, it's a standard that has to be met, and that you said it's got to be interpreted by the zoning board. That only one, draw, one driveway may be authorized on a lot, provided, however, that an additional driveway access may be authorized by the Board of Selectmen. Well, I'm trying to figure out who, is, who has the jurisdiction of the authority to do that. That's where I'm unclear on. Board of Selectmen are the only ones who can authorize an extra curb cut. Okay. So if, if someone is going to be, if, if someone's going to receive relief, well, you, you want to use the term relief. If someone's going to ask for a, uh, a second driveway. They have to go to the Board of Selectmen first. Okay. And then they come. It doesn't have to be approved by the ZBA? So they don't, even though it says right in there, only one access driveway may be authorized? Well, but then there's like, an exception that says that it can be authorized. You can have I understand that road. the road commissions and they have to do a yeah. curb cut. What I'm trying to say is, does, does someone have to get permission from the ZBA first before it goes to the Board of Selectmen, or they can just go to the Board of Selectmen? No, it's the other way around. First you go to the Board of Selectmen and you get the extra curb cut. Then you come to the ZBA okay, well, and they apply yeah. everything else. Yeah. That's it can still it's be unclear. rejected by ZBA, regardless of what the Board of Selectmen Okay, well, I just want to make sure that it's clear. That's all. I just, to me, it's not clear that which comes first. I, can I just say something, Leanne, with on uh, to on Walnut Street? One of the comments that I sent in in a letter um, to Jean and Jesse this morning was, overall, yeah, I know that you've got some diagrams for houses and all that and the side setbacks and all that. In light of the fact that you are starting to talk about different boards and changing who has you know the, the special permit granting authority, CPDC? You've got you know the zoning uh, board of selectmen, different titles. Um, 
graphics are a huge thing. What would you think about applying flowchart process diagrams for specific groups that might have more detailed so step-by-step -step process? Yeah, we, we have. We've talked about that a lot, and we are developing them. We have some already. We're not going to put them in the zoning bylaw, per right. se. But, but we use an appendix? They'll be made available through, through, the, yeah. Yeah, through, through the, the town planner's uh, office. Community Services Department. Yeah. So would that be part of, you know, would it say re reference appendix for this particular group? Because that would be helpful to have a reference within the zoning bylaw, or I don't know how what the procedure is for putting information in. I just think it would make it clear for people like myself that don't know the process, um, for if you're going to be having a lot more counter help helping you, it's going to make it clearer for them. You know, just it would make it easier if people had more ideas and more visual pieces to refer to. Because a lot of times people don't deal with all this legal Text. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, please. Yeah. Do you know what I, so, know what I mean? Really, on a basic level. If I could level. just respond to that, Jim yeah. Delio's, um, I'm, I, there are a couple of things. One, the thing that we've identified through this process with the Zoning Advisory Committee are items to be dealt with in the future. Flow charts, permitting, guides, and the like fall into that category. Mm -hmm. So that's something we will be developing independent of this zoning bylaw work, but it'll be a subsequent step. What happens now is we spend an inordinate amount of time at the counter explaining processes to people. Um, so we do that now in great detail when people come and start the process of doing this. Jesse and I meet with people all the time that are saying, I'm thinking about doing something, I don't know where to start. And we sit down, someone wanted to do a paint and sip business. Between the two of us, we devoted about 25 hours with that person explaining the process, going through everything, and then they didn't end up doing the thing. So we spend a lot of time guiding people. That's what we do. Um, but you're right. The flow charts for something on the website especially, I think we'll get to that, but we're not going to get to that right now. Yeah, and I mean, part of that is that the, the zoning bylaw has a very rigid statutory uh, process in order to get it um, proposed, voted on, approved by the state attorney general in, in the waiting period, and then it finally goes into effect uh, like 60 days after the state attorney general approves it, if they do. We don't want a procedural guide to be stuck with that process. I mean, that's not something that we would ever want to write into the zoning bylaw because it would then be controlled by the the state regulated uh, process for any change to it which is in a word silly you know, we absolutely understand that we need them yeah for parents to tell them step one sure. step two cross yeah. over George the George has down to step three so you know exactly where yeah. it's going what procedures what order so. yeah and, and we've got the examples of the award-winning uh, such uh, booklet from Dedham. Dedham. George has done three or four different drafts of, of the flowcharts. We will certainly have them. We understand. We're just going to keep them separate from no, the I just, It's a lot easier than reading through, through all this and trying to figure out how to oh, yeah, just for sure. flow chart. Okay. So well, one second. Let me just ask. Anybody, what other comments do we have? I just want to see if there's any other voices out there. But go ahead, Doug. I didn't really plan on talking that much. <laughs> um, it, and this, as a, this is the first time I've been here, that's why, you, but, and it's really ugly. And, uh, you know, obviously there's a lot of hard work because if with more people that sit here, the more questions you need to ask. But I'm back on B on the area and the relationship between the size and the ability to put a, an apartment in an already existing structure um, by right. And so I think that the question was referred to a little bit back there and a little bit by Nancy on, say, just I'm going to try and base this on an example. If we have a house that's 1,800 square feet to currently, we could, by, by under this, we could put a 600 square foot apartment into the existing house, correct? Correct. Now, if I'm <coughs> wanted, because I can see I'm going to do this project in the near future, 
I, I don't have it yet, but I know it's going to happen. Um, if on that house somebody wanted to put a family room addition on the left and turn the right-hand side of the house into an apartment, does that come as a buy right apartment? And I could then go, so I have 1,800 square foot house, I'm putting a 600 square foot addition on the side, which may, makes my house now 2,400 square feet. Therefore, I'd be allowed an 800 square foot apartment. 750. 750, whatever. Is that apartment by right at 750 square feet? And is the addition a separate, you know what I'm saying? Then the next question that comes to that is, so what I'm learning is that if people want to put an apartment in their house that's bigger than 600 square feet, I should build them an addition and then as soon as I'm done with the addition, we should just turn it into an apartment. Except that you probably would not get the building permit for the second kitchen and the other aspects of, until you had enlarged the house. No, I know that, but I can, I can very quickly put two pipes in for a kitchen faster than I can get a special permit through the ZBA. I, it, it, you know, I, and well, I don't think you can restrict that. I don't think you can restrict time and say you can't put an addition on and then you can't have an apartment for the next two years. But I can see that what's going to happen is immediately I'm going to say, well, let's build the addition and then your square footage is already up. Now we can have more space for the... What's, what's your apartment. concern? Do you want to prevent your neighbor from doing no, that? No, I, I just... I do don't you know want to be able to do that? The question comes down to the addition part with relationships. Does that have any effect on the square footage of the apartment well, if it's not in the addition? The answer is I don't know offhand. I mean, until it comes up. But which way would you prefer it to be? What are you advocating? Uh, I or would probably a, advocate a that they're separate entities, that I can increase the square foot of my house at the same time, and that would increase the size of the allowed apartment. As long as the apartment's in the existing as, house. As long as the apartment's probably not part of the additional <coughs> space that's being constructed. Right. Well, I mean, it's... I don't know of anything here that particularly specifies one way or the other. You know, I don't know how Glenn would interpret that. There, and that's why I'm asking the question now, so that I know when it comes time for him to interpret it, whether or not it, it, it's it, tough. I mean, there's so many scenarios, and right. what ifs okay. that I don't you think we'll be able to solve for all of them. Well, what does this table tell us? Once the, exit, once the addition exists. Right. Right. Yeah, I mean, yes. it's that is correct. Right. So once it's done, then you can use that addition if you wanted to. Yes. You just can't do it in one permit. You can't do it in one permit, you have to do it in two. Right. Okay. Yeah. George? I think I think the intent when we were looking at this chart was to allow by right pre existing yeah. part, not existing. Pre existing that exists as of the day of this bylaw being voted. So whatever the number is out in town, who have already a kitchen, a bathroom, a bedroom, and it's living water, and somehow they can prove that it is pre-existing. There's no new piping, no new drainage, no new pillows and bedrooms. It's pre-existing. Then it's by right to legalize it. That was part of the discussion in the zoning advisory committee. think I feel like I'm, I'm comfortable with what you described I do recall that conversation but it seems like this may be easier to enforce one second Angela because Tom no you're good okay. yeah, I think I, I asked whether or not this at the meeting the other day whether this addresses all of those illegal apartments and it's only if they apply for it. So, but when you see pre-existing, 
I was confused by that pre-existing attached to pre-existing detached. Whether I was confused whether because I thought it meant contained within. I mean, th so this chart is really ambiguous as to 5.4.8.2, what it refers to, whether it refers to. Well, the intent was to, was to simplify it. We seem to have confused <laughs> the, the, uh, It's ambiguous because when you have attached, I mean, I was thinking, I don't think of an apartment that's being built within a house as being attached. I think of it as being within, and I think of something attached as something adjoined. Well, that's the... I, well, I actually looked up the definition of attached because I was confused by that, and it did talk about being something adjoined to. So I, so I, so this chart is, is confusing, what, what you mean. And I did ask at the last meeting whether this whole thing addresses the, you know, all of those legal departments. And I think the answer that I got was that it, it didn't really. It was about going forward. Right. Okay. Right. I, you know, I'm, I don't know where we are on this. When I drew the table in the first place, I used different words, and they got modified. <laughs> so. <laughs> would, would I mean? We can make it clear. I, I think that this is probably much better than what we have right now. Um, we can change the attached to within. I don't think that's an issue. Well, the, the basically, that's what you mean. basically, that's what I sort of thought you meant with pre. But I, but I was the, looking. The at this. three cases, the three cases that we were trying to handle was pre-existing structures attached, or you know within whatever you want to call it. Pre-existing structures detached, i.e., carriage house, stair, stable barn, or new construction without a qualifier. Basically, if it's new construction, you need a special permit. And if it's, it's pre-existing structures detached, we want you to come for a special permit. I mean, that was the, that was the, the three cases that we wanted to handle. How do you want to put that into a table? Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> do you have something? It, well, it, you know, the, the Lexington has that the apartment is constructed to maintain the appearance of it. Three categories of accessory apartments are permitted. By right accessory apartments, which are permitted as of right, special permit accessory apartments, and accessory structure apartments, which may be allowed as a special permit. So they don't have a chart. They just say there are three categories. So if you have four categories or something, to just say what they are, you know, uh, because I'm now I'm confused what is allowed by right and what isn't allowed by right. Just looking at this and from the discussion. So, I mean, when I look at this chart, the only thing that I see as being allowed by right is like if you put an apartment in your basement or that's right. That's right. Yes. Is that what you is that what you're saying? Yes. yes. Or what? No. 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 It's new construction it was, attached. No, it was. Right, so, so family room. Not part of the original. Right, yeah. If you have yes. a family room, you, you want to convert a large family room, room in, oh. yeah, out of kitchen and a bathroom to a big yes. family room. But as long as, as your, all of the construction is happening inside the house and not outside the house. That's mm -hmm. what I think that means. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what it's intended That's right. That's right. It's like clearly now. But it's clearly the house. So what, what, team, what are we? What are you doing over there? Are we trying um, to I'm just putting it down as it comes. These are <laughs> just little notes. Um, if you guys want to tackle the table and use this language, just give a holler. Or remove the table because it appears to not help. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it, there's one other place where I I took out a table exactly for that reason. It would take it out of here. It would take us a while to write those paragraphs, but if, if you'd rather have it written out as a, as a paragraph, we'll do it. Well, it sounds like that's what we need. Okay. 
Marcy? I would say that I think that we just need to change the wording in the chart we have. I actually like having the chart. It makes it very easy to see. Let's change the wording so that the confusion is cleared up as opposed to getting rid of the table. It's much easier to see a table and, and you can see it's by right it's special permit. So. Okay. Well, could, I'm sorry. Could you use the word pre-existing no change to footprint for... Yeah by right or something along those lines. Use the existing footprint as the qualifier for changing within another word. I don't know. The shell, right? The shell. But as it went. The shell, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, yes, it is. It's right. It's, it's the whole outside of the house, right? It's yeah. not just exterior. the exterior. Well, it could be the exterior. The existing no, exterior. No change to no exterior. exterior. No exterior. No exterior. No exterior. Yeah. Yeah. No exterior. Yeah. No exterior. Yeah. Change windows, yeah. yeah. I just wanted to see what we get. We'll figure out what we the heading once we figure out what we do. We dive into this? We want to. I think we should. Change? Yes. Okay. Let's do it. So. You could change your, windows, though. I don't, so I don't know about no changes to the exterior. Right. I'm thinking more volume or footprint. I bet you could use that as a qualifier, no additional volume or footprint. Volume or square footage. Or square footage, footage, yeah. footage. Something along those lines. Okay. We're not saying what kind of square footage, but you're going to the basement, right. and storage, and yeah. something like that. Well, that's right. Good. But that's okay. Gross floor area yeah. thing. We're going with the footprint. Can I make a point of clarification? Yeah. Whatever you're doing doesn't change your problem. Which I don't think is really a problem. Mm -hmm. All you're, all I mean, all it is is an order of operations question, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Yes. And and what you're doing here isn't changing potential order of operations Correct. because you're not putting a date. And one of the fundamental things we took out of the bylaws was the date of 1982 yeah. on purpose because of the complexity of monitoring a, a specific date. Mm -hmm. So all of these changes that are being discussed is actually not solving the quote problem, which isn't really a problem in my it's not, not so humble no. opinion. It's just. All we're trying to go for is within or not within. That's really all it comes mm -hmm. down to. Right. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. So no addition to gross floor area. Yep. Our principal dwelling. Our principal dwelling. <coughs> okay. And then the second one is no addition to gross floor area of accessory building. I don't know if you need any more, cap, you know, basically no addition to principal building or other. Scratch this. Scratch, scratch that the whole column. column. Can you can you delete that whole column? Sure. But you got to select it from the top. Yeah. There you go. And that and that hit the. One second. So then you just say other. Right. That's well, why I say to. other? I mean, why not hmm. say something? We're trying to make it clearer. I think other will confuse people. Okay. Well, you can leave it as um, modification of modification of existing structure or uh, new construction. I mean, those are the basic moves. That's right. I would clarify. An addition then would qualify this. As yeah. With construction or alteration? We well, use the word alteration. Right. No, alteration no. would be back up to, because you're altering if you're within the principal building yeah. to make it into a, so it would be addition. Do you have a comment on this? Because I, I don't want to, I don't want to lose momentum on this. New construction. You think it's wrong? 
There's three categories, really, right? That's all we care. I mean, what initially what came down to, and I'm sorry if I jumped in, so if I need to back up, I will. Well, no, I want to stay but on this. What, what we came down to was the existing, the existing house, and David, you've been through a lot of this, so please tell us what. You know, the existing, if you're in the existing house as it is, and you're not doing anything, it's by right. If you're, if you're outside, if you're in a carriage house or a, an accessory use building that's not the principal building, then we want to talk to you at special permit. It's not by right. If you're doing any sort of new construction or alteration, then it's special permit. We want to talk to you. It's those three categories. Mm -hmm. That's all it comes down to. Yep. Right. Can, can we, so get rid of the fourth. Well. Can we actually change these so we have principal dwelling first and accessory building first and the no addition? Secondary, because that's sort of the key key words in these. Put principal dwelling, accessory building first. Yeah, mm -hmm. principal dwelling first in that one, and then. Is that right? Yeah. Didn't we say we want to take out four alterations because you have to alter the no, floor plan? No, this says or no, addition. No, it says or addition. Or addition, okay. Thank you. Can't see from back here. Okay. New yep. construction or addition. Yeah, I think that's. Yeah, that makes sense. No, doesn't make sense. Okay. Somebody I don't understand that. principal versus accessory. I mean, that doesn't say that. If I'm putting an apartment in the basement, I'm getting a permit to do some new construction in that basement. Making Everything to make the apartment would be new construction. No. So it would be. But you're not increasing gross I know increasing Right, <coughs> but that's what I'm saying down the bottom. I'm still doing. So change the, change the word construction to structure. New structure. New structure. <laughs> new structure or or increasing gross floor area. New yeah. structure. New structure or, or addition, addition to, to, floor, to gross Addition to gross floor area. Yeah. So you don't need the construction, just yes. new structure. You're doing, you're doing great job. I have a lot of experience. No sweat. <laughs> <laughs> Angela, how's that? Nothing, nothing like drafting by committee. It's all right. I know. I know. For a year plus. I know. Uh, 14 months. <laughs> doing great. What Almost was done. Yeah, be no, that's not I, an addition. What's the, hold on. No, no, no I think. I knew it's standalone building. Did, yeah. Go ahead. Okay. The difficult part of that was it, it, it was all under the grade area that says principal single family dwelling, and it's not. You need to talk about principal single family dwelling and accessory building. So principal single family dwelling. Yeah, so take out the principal single family Either within the new construction yeah. so or, yeah. yeah, so yeah. you need... Yeah. You need yes, to look. She got it. Yep. Yep. Like, yeah. It does exactly what you want to do. Yeah. So this is, the, yeah. It's exactly. But that. Th does this not accomplish that? It does. does it? I couldn't it's see right. back there. Yeah. So that was what I was thinking. Okay. That, so it just shows that it's. Yeah. Types. Because you know, yes, it's the two different types of structures. Yeah. Type. I don't know what And you and. And you don't really talk about Good. accessory buildings. Toys for there. Yep. Oh, okay. yeah. Accessory. So I mean, you, you so might want to say new accessory building instead of new structure, just to align with the rest of your definitions. Well, it might not be well, new accessory building. Yeah. Exactly. No, we don't want to okay. say that. So you don't no. want it. I think we're good. Let's leave it at this. I think this is a com this accomplishes what what, where we want it to go. Building mm -hmm. You're building a new house, or you're building a new okay. accessory building. Okay. Thank you. Fix that. All right. So we have. Beating the heck out of accessory apartments <laughs> and accessory structures. Yeah. And we, I mean, I think we kind of anticipated this. Right, well, of course. We we're at, you know, we're at a better spot thanks to a lot of good input. 
Um, I, I still have some comments from the previous conversation, which we haven't jumped into, but let's... Can we take a five-minute break? Take a five-minute break. <laughs>
Meeting back to order. So, at this point, I think we've taken accessory apartments and structures as far as we need to. <laughs> what other comments outside of those areas do we have? Yes, Tom. Gene has said, let's use you as a case example a couple times. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's use me as a case example in my process example. We don't, and I'm not sure if this can go into zoning bylaws, so if you guys can tell me to shut up right now if it's necessary, but in my case, I had to go for the Board of Selectmen, the ZBA, the, C, the CPDC, and the Conservation Commission. If any one of those boards had said, we like it, but you need to move it a foot this way or a foot that way, I have to start the whole process all over again with each one of them. Because there's this stipulation about changing you know, rules of what it is. You, know, you, you change your plot line, you change your lot line by half a foot. So go back and resubmit the process and go through the whole thing. So what I would like to recommend, and I don't know whether it can happen in, the zone, in, in this space or if it's something else that can happen outside, considering it's a town process, I would like to recommend that cases that require more than one zoning, pro more than one constituency, be able to bring a super case together, such that you can have the, the ruling bodies meet together and make one either adjustment decision or one decision overall. Because the back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, rises my costs, increases my frustration, which is exactly against what we're trying to do here, and overall leads to a very long and arduous process for all parties involved, including yourselves. Yep. Yeah. Um, I think that's a really excellent point. The um, uh, having here's where the challenge is. You're you're tr trying to make the point that to consolidate the permitting review, and so that would mean having a collective meeting of the various boards and do it once. We have tried that. There's a couple issues. One is you have to get a quorum of each of the boards. So from a scheduling point of view, that can often be the biggest hurdle. That, that's the first thing. The second thing is some boards, I'll say like the Board of Selectmen with the driveway thing, that could be like a 10 minute thing before the Board of Selectmen. So now we're saying to the Board of Selectmen, you have to come to a um, multi-board meeting that could be two, three hours. So it, it becomes challenging. I totally understand it, totally. Um, it's just coincidental that because of a ZBA-related change, I would have had to go back before the Board of Selectmen again. And so what became what started with 10 minutes is now going to become 20 or 30. What then, be, you know, then that could have led to a CPDC change when you moved their foot mm -hmm. on. Now you need to talk to the CPDC again. Then you start back in ZBA. Okay, well, we don't like that because we disagree with your measurement of whether this is 750. We think it's 752. So now you got to shave two inches off the house all the way around. You start the whole process again. So if if you if you cannot simplify the process then perhaps we need to put in a standard of reasonable change such that the previous ruling is still applicable without having to go and file the process. And that I don't know what reasonable is, I know it's hard to determine reasonability, but one thing I think reasonable minds can agree to disagree as well, that you know Minimal changes, I think, somehow needs to be allowed and incorporated within those bodies to say, we don't need to review this again. And you've seen some of the correspondence yeah. I've had on this issue. Or technically, I didn't change the, the plot plan of where my driveway was going, but because the plot plan changed for the size of my house, <coughs> the town manager decided I have to go back before the, the board of selectmen. That's, a, you know, the driveway didn't change. Yeah. <laughs> But those are the kind of things I'm just trying to figure out how we could address in the in either a side process conversation 
which may be where it needs to go. And if you want to table it, I'm fine with that. I'm happy to have further discussions. Or in some sort of, because there are process <laughs> portions of the zoning bylaw, in some sort of super process portion of the zoning bylaw that says, in such a case where more than one ruling body will be triggered, the, the appealant has the, has the ability to call for a special meeting or something like that. Yeah, I mean, we've done a lot of work to kind of streamline the process. I think in your situation, yeah, it, it got, it's clearly got out of hand. I don't know if there's a reasonable and customary type precedent out there, like they have in health insurance, but is there anything like that that other, I'm looking at town council yeah. to say yeah. if there's anything out there that. Well, I, I don't know anything about his specific the circumstances. Oh, you should hear. Okay. Good. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, um, you don't have to write in something that says um, that, you know, if, if you have a project that requires a special permit from the ZBA and one from the, from, um, the uh, CPDC, um, you could write you could write in a, something here that says that that they can request that the hearings on all special permits. That's easier to do than with the conservation commission because mm -hmm. that we, we can't put anything in the zoning that's going to affect what the conservation commission does. But another th another idea that that maybe would help, but again, I don't know what the specific circumstances are, is if you get into the habit of writing into your special permits language that says that the um, that minor modifications to the special permit can be approved by the building inspector. And then you don't have to, sure. then they don't have to come back to you. Yep. You don't need specific authorization to do that, you could just do it. Um, I was well, jump in. Yeah, please, Jim. Yeah, the, for, for people that aren't familiar with what the situation was, the reason this came to CPDC is because it was on a scenic road. We have two streets in the town of Reading that are scenic roads. He happens okay. to be on both of them. <laughs> 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 I do, but, Two streets. But even outside of that. I think there's actually three. Okay. The, three streets. The Board of Selectmen rehearing would have, or theoretically from town manager's perspective, would have applied because of the ZBA required changes to the plan. Mm -hmm. so, so you've got this rule, and Mr. Webb has a <coughs> question. Even, and you and I, anyway. You've got this rule that says you have to have Board of Selectmen approval first. Okay, fine. I got that. You go to the ZBA, you say, all right, well, this is good, but you need to make this change. This, this, that happens all the time. Those changes result in a change in the plot plan. The town manager then says, well, you change the plot plan. That's the only thing that's required for the Board of Selectmen approval is the plot plan. Even if you haven't changed where the driveway is, you change the plot plan, so you change the plan, you have to go back again. And there is no Board of Selectmen documentation, as far as I've seen, like there is with CPDC, like there is with conservation, like there is with ZBA. It's just yes, no, rubber stamp, you're done, as far as I've seen. Somebody can tell me I'm wrong. Mercy, tell me I'm wrong. Um, but that's all I've seen. <laughs> so it's just this nasty cyclical loop, especially since we've built in the cyclical loop, which I like. I don't have a problem with that, except for the fact that I can't resolve it in one meeting. George? So the state government has had this problem like forever. <laughs> and they have a new document called mm -hmm. Lean Government, which allows the streamline. Are you familiar with Lean? They pulled Lean from industry. Lean is yeah. a big industry. If that could be guidance, yeah. their Lean guidelines could be guidance for the town. I don't know um, how the administrative rules that we're trying to write for a town planner. Uh, to look at these situations mm -hmm. and you know how at some point it becomes an administrative item rather than a substance item. Yeah. There is a there is a cut in line. And Which I'm perfectly fine with that yeah. is that table it and we can yeah. have further conversation. We've got a but healthy parking lot that yeah. we will add this to for sure. Go ahead, Dave. Well there's I mean we have had on um, odd occasions joint meetings of C P D C and, and the Board of Selectmen. And we had it with the uh, Home, Depot. Uh, Home Depot parking lot, uh, rig'em runaround, I guess was the, the only way to put it. Open storage and a variety That's of other things. Rental. Yeah. Uh, it's always awkward because the, specifically the boards operate under different uh, authorizations, different procedures. In other words, the ZBA has an entirely different set of statutory uh, envelope 
compared to the CPDC and the Board of Selectmen. So putting them putting them all together in, the, in a single meeting probably actually doesn't solve your problem <laughs> because they, I mean, the things may bounce back and forth, but the statutory requirements for each board are different and they're sufficiently different that we're, you know, we, we're human beings, we understand, we try to be reasonable, um, but we're at the mercy of the state uh, laws and others uh, in some cases. So we will, let's, let, probably not something we're going to be able to solve for, for this go yeah. round, but we hear you. Thank you. You know, it's, it's something on a, on a case by case. opportunities for us to streamline the process, and so we have talked about that. It probably doesn't get to what you want, which is a single super meeting, but there are opportunities for us to streamline and to make that process cleaner. And so yeah. we certainly look at it and consider are there some ways to I think his wording, his wording idea is is in the right direction for those bodies that have such wording. Mm -hmm. I don't think right. the Board of Selectmen has such wording. Conservation, mm -hmm. I think I could have talked to Chuck and resolved the thing with conservation because there is wording like that. Mm -hmm. But the Board of Selectmen portion, I could not. There's no yeah. wording for a Board of Selectmen ruling. Maybe that's something, not that I want more paperwork to file with my mortgage. Um, but maybe that's something that would be considered that a reasonable change within this from a board of selectmen perspective is not, not relevant and does not need to come back in. Tony, did you have a comment? Well, I was just wondering under what circumstances is a design review team called together? I know when you have bigger projects like the Home Depot and so forth, yeah. uh, town staff gets together to help iron out a lot of these little issues to try and present something to the boards that's consistent for everybody. Yeah, we, we normally, um, the development review team meets on um, projects that are going to have some sort of an impact. So um, we just looked at the new um, facade improvement to Family Dental. Um, we'll have a, we didn't have a, a DRT for that. We, we'll have a pre-construction, but that's a small project. Mm -hmm. That doesn't. It's a change of a facade of a building in the downtown. It's it's things that trigger you know new parking requirements, things that the police department might be interested in, or the fire department might have a concern <coughs> about. This really doesn't rise to that level. Yeah, it's, I mean the DRT is is typically when you've got multiple departments involved, like yeah. the public safety, uh, fire, um, and the engineering. Town engineer. You know, I mean, it's that's typically what the justification slash trigger for the DRT is, and it's it's not the boards per se; it's the, the departments. Thanks for that feedback, though, Tom. No, Appreciate helpful. that. The real issue is when there's a minor change, and we've dealt with that here, having it be handled administratively rather than bring somebody back. That's. That's what I hear is your your main point. Is that, I mean, that is scheduling having to go to four meetings, kind of a pain in the end, and paying thousands of dollars. I mean, the amount of money I've spent on, on board meetings and architects and for four different meetings because the rules have changed each meeting is is not mm -hmm. inconsequential. Mm -hmm. Did you have to go to conservation too? Yes. That was my easiest meeting, thank you very much. <laughs> Outside of Board of <laughs> Board of Selectmen was easy, conservation was relatively easy. Then it got more tricky. So what what other comments do we have? Do you want to hear a few more? <laughs> sure. This is, um, I'm looking at 7.4, dimensional requirements. I just have some clarifications and, and it's really nothing. I just want to make sure I understand it. So one is um, 7.5, and I know I brought that up at the uh, last hearing on Thursday night, and I guess it's, this what this is saying is that lots Say that have again. been yeah that have been seven point four seven point five single, single lot, lot exemption for single family and two family dwelling. So if that lot is in conformance, it can be built upon without having by right is what it's telling me, right? So I just brought it up <coughs> in terms of summer out whether that was 
something in effect. And I think the answer there is that it was probably a lot that was in common ownership and then right. subdivided. Mm -hmm. So then it doesn't qualify mm -hmm. for being mm -hmm. exempt. Okay, yep. right. I just wanted to clarify. Yep. Mm -hmm. right. 7.8, voluntary demolition and reconstruction. In the past, when we have homes that have been uh, in a state of disrepair that we have to tear them down, but the lot is non-conforming, we have always had to go before ZBA for a special permit. Is this telling me that I no longer have to do that as long as the structure that we're building is in conformance with all of the setbacks? Because it used to be triggered by changing the location of the building or increasing the volume. And I see that volume has been removed. Deliberately. Right, which is good. And then the second piece to this is the building permit, let's see, building inspector may issue a building permit if the proposed reconstruction will not extend the nonconformity or create a new nonconformity. So if I design a new house that sits within all of the setbacks, I shouldn't have to go to the ZBA even though the lot is nonconforming. That's correct. Yep. That's correct. Same footprint. Well, that's just its same footprint. I don't, where does that say? That's in B, B, B. In the event that the proposed reconstruction would cause the structure to exceed the lot coverage of the original non-conforming building. So if I increase the lot coverage of the original non-conforming building or structure, or cause the building or structure to be located on other than the original mm, footprint, okay. the building inspector may issue a building permit if the proposed reconstruction will not extend the nonconformity or create a new nonconformity. Mm -hmm. right. Isn't that what I'm reading? Is that mm -hmm. I can build a new house of I a different can. size in a location as long as it doesn't yep. doesn't cause yes. any yeah. It yeah. So, it doesn't so it doesn't have to go back right. doesn't have to go to ZBA anymore. Right. right. Yahoo. <laughs> <laughs> that was the goal on that one. Yeah. yeah. That, that, that was simple. the goal. That was good <laughs> because that was ridiculous. Good. Thank you. I'm pleased. What other comments do we have? Doug, any, anything else from your perspective? Thank you. Tony, I know we've got, um, I saw an email. Of pages. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of, couple of comments from you, apparently. <laughs> well, so let me, let me ask the board. I know it's getting late, and um, we have the option to come back on Thursday, or we can crank through this a little bit more. What is it, what do people prefer? Well, let's take a. I haven't seen Tony comments that came in after I left, so I wasn't sure if these were mostly just uh, cross references and typos. And like that I believe a lot of them are going to be addressed by the town council review draft. So um, I think <coughs> some mix of cross references that are incorrect and yep. wording yep. and so forth. Catches, mm -hmm. Tony's catches. So. Anything that is not going to be Substantial. caught there? Content. Yeah. Going over the list again. <laughs> uh, well, I did have a question on yeah. abandonment while town council is here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Originally, uh, the original bylaw did not refer to intent. Mm -hmm. The new abandonment refers to intent, and I'm questioning whether that is because of state and case law. Or is that just that we term to include it that? So, so yes, it, it reflects case law. Mm -hmm. Abandonment, so um, the, the, uh, when you have a non-conforming structure or non-conforming use, mm -hmm. it, it disappears. So what, what the state law says is that if it's abandoned, it is um, wiped out. Can't re you can't. And the case law says abandonment exists when you form an intent to discontinue, and you um, uh, take some affirmative step. You know, so you form the intent to close your business, and you actually close it. Okay, that occurs when that happens. You discontinued it instantaneously, not two years later. Instantaneously, when those two things happen. Many bylaws, including this one, say, and besides that, if you if you 
cease to use it for two years, then that's discontinued regardless of what your intent was. So the guy that says, oh, I'm, I'm closing it, but I'm not really, I'm, I'm hoping that I'm going to reopen it just any day now. After two years, you, we don't have to sit around and wait anymore. We just say that's no longer, that, that's no longer. Uh, so is that uh, in, our, in the new proposal? In the new proposal, it, you, it says both. It says abandon mm -hmm. or discontinue for two years. Just making sure we get all this saved. Okay. <coughs> we still have trouble with that one because uh, we have to, uh, a case on Main 7. Street 7. where 7. 9, I believe. the uh, technical attempts to sell the property was justified or was certain determined to be use. But that's a risk. Mm -hmm. George? Uh, Nick, under state building law, a building that is not occupied for two years is not an existing building. Is that correct? Is it two or is it five? We should check on that because if you're not if you're not entitled to the provisions of an existing building and you have to look at your building in a new eye, not the existing building code, that might be a problem. So we may want to coincide with that. I don't know what the building inspector might say on that. In other words, you're not entitled to the uh, beneficial features of existing building code working in the existing building if your building is not occupied for two years or three, whatever that number is. Okay. So, I don't know of any special reason why why your zoning needs to um, follow the same processes as the building code. The reason the, the, the building code is attempting to address the problem that we've got a building that's been sitting there for a long time, empty, and I forget what, how many years, that's why they write these things down so we don't have to remember the numbers. But, um, uh, but the, the purpose of the building code, it, that provision of the building code is that once you take that building and you decide to, to, to um, rejuvenate it, you have to bring it up to the new code standards. Um, um, what we, what we, here we're talking about, uh, about zoning standards, which are um, uh, the, the whole the dynamic of, of zoning is um, to slowly whittle away at non-conforming uses and non-conforming structures. They're protected, but they're only protected as long as they continue to be exercised. And if you don't exercise them, they're not protected because we really don't want them. So it's, kind of, it's a different, it, it's a different um, right. um, uh, purpose, and so it's not surprising that the rules might be different. Tell me what is going to happen for a three-family home? I know that one and two families are defined, four families are defined as multi-family, but three families are not referenced. It is a, uh, a non-conforming use. I mean, it's okay. So they don't qualify as multi-family. They're non-conforming use at this point. Right. Commercial. Anything more than by building code, anything more than two family is considered commercial. So it would be a multi-family at three, which would require sprinklers, et cetera. If it's existing, it's different. But if it's if it's a three-family house, it would require sprinklers now. It comes under all the the commercial code requirements. It okay. just do the three-family one building? that was not referenced. Do we do oh, I see. Multi-family. Yeah. 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 I mean, it, it was not previously dwelling referenced, up. and it's still not referenced. It's building okay. So. <laughs> I mean that, yeah. that the, the definition of multifamily dwelling, as now proposed, is a building or portion there containing three or more dwelling units. Right. So yeah. a three family uh, now, is now part of a multifamily. Okay. I mean, that, that exactly matches what the state law is. State law has all these special provisions for one and two families. 
and um, in the town I live with, and there's lots and lots and lots of triple deckers. Um, they're not acknowledged until the law as being a separate kind of business. And Mr. Chair, another question for town council. I thought when a uh, zoning ordinance failed town meeting, there was a two-year moratorium before you could bring it back. How would this apply to section one? Well, two things. Um, that only applies if it is a, uh, a citizen-sponsored. Um, it doesn't apply if it's sponsored by um, the CPDC. Or, um, and in any case, it, all, it only says if it, unless it's recommended by the CPDC or by the, the statute says the planning board. But the, the point is, it just means that if a citizen brings a zoning change, and then and it loses. It can't come back for two years unless the planning board recommends that it be approved. So they have one extra step. But it doesn't mean that 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 um, the CPDC couldn't recommend some new version of, of section one in the spring. Which we plan to do. <laughs> As you might have guessed. If you want to go over all the little ones I've got, I can do that or we can no. call the meeting for tonight. Well, yeah, I don't think we need to go through all your little ones. I, don't think, I think they're going to be caught, but I know there's changes, updates we need to make to the table of uses. Table of right? uses, yep. And there's that section that you wanted to remember. What do you guys think? Do you want to keep going? Okay. Well, yes. come back mm -hmm. yeah, I think, um, there's, I think yeah, I, yeah. there's a couple of more things to get to, one being the table of uses and one being a recommendation by town council on one of the sections. Okay. okay. So it's a section that has to do with cell towers. Um, um, Reading has a what we would call an old style zoning bylaw for cell towers, um, which does not, which will not work very well um, in, an, in an, any actual case. And that's the reason is is that telecommunications facilities are controlled by the Federal Telecommunications Act, and it requires that um, we, uh, that uh, whenever a, a telecommunications provider can demonstrate that they have a gap in service, um, that they are uh, entitled to fill that gap. And so when you have a one like ours that, that um, tries to limit cell towers to particular geographic areas, um, you're, going, you're going to end up with trouble because they'll come to you and say, we have a gap and what we need to do is to put uh, an antennas you know, on this church steeple in the center, center of town, for example. It would not be permitted under the zoning, under the zoning bylaw as, as written. So we have written new zoning bylaws for many towns, or at least several towns, let's say, um, that take all of those federal standards and bring them into the permitting process here so that we make them demonstrate to us um, that there is a gap and that this is necessary and this is the least intrusive way of, of dealing with the gap so that all of that doesn't end up being the subject of, um, of litigation in federal court. So we'd rather have the decision process happen here rather than at, in federal court. The way this works, as I understand it now, is if somebody were to come in and say, we want to put a cell tower and we need to put it here to fill a gap, their only option is to go before the um, ZBA and get a variance. And, and we don't think that, um, that that's a very good option because the, the grounds for variance are quite narrow. So we would recommend that section 5.6.3 be held in abeyance um, so that we can propose, we, we can talk to you about what you want, and then we can propose a new section that, that ad more adequately protects you against federal litigation. Um, and obviously not do that in November, but put it off till spring. Um, so. Um, What's the phrase you used? Held in? Abeyance. Abeyance? Oh, okay. Till spring. Okay. 
Uh, so that's right. That section is within the part that you're intending to go forward with. So, um, uh, but it, there's it would take a considerable amount of discussion to get something that that actually you would like to have, and that also would would protect you from um, uh, from federal litigation, and um, we just think that's too too big a bite to take. It, in this first round, we'd rather wait and do it in the spring. Yeah, the um, I believe that the this was a recodification rather than a modification. Right. So this is basically exactly the words the wording we right. have now. Right. It and it shows. Yeah. Um, uh, we've had towns that have had to redo their zoning um, that um, two or three times because. Um, um, because of two things. One is that the federal law changed, and the other thing is that um, that you know the initial reaction was we don't want these anywhere, um, and and then they sort of turn around after at some point that people start complaining that there's not decent cell phone service, and so all of a sudden right. these towers don't seem so bad. Um, but this is a complicated area. Most zoning bylaws that address this are at least several pages long. There's a number of different combinations and permutations that we could talk about. But we just can't do it in this time frame. So we threw up our hands and said, <clears throat> we're not going to try to rewrite this without having had any discussion about it. Yeah, well, well that's, I mean, so let's not. Just yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> okay. let, it, let it remain as is. Is this like a combination of a 40B and a medical marijuana coming together? Or like, is that <laughs> going to be like a set? We want to deal with it as a separate standalone thing because it might yes. be a very lengthy process just yeah. to get something out, especially given the height, the appearance, the illusion that you get cancer underneath. You know, who knows what will come up in this? Oh, so we know that that's what I'm saying. What I'm saying is to be separated and taken at a, at a maybe as a, as a standalone article. Right, in the spring. Mm -hmm. That's what he suggests. Yes, yeah, well, exactly. Very, um, just, just so that you're aware, um, the federal law does not allow uh, local regulation of health effects of, from telecommunications facilities. So, um, so you will undoubtedly hear about all of the various potential health effects when the time comes. And unfortunately, the response needs to be, um, you can't consider that. And well, that's yeah. unfortunate. Okay, I mean, it sounds like you're recommending that we strike the entire paragraph and just forget it. Well, no, I, don't do that. I mean, just, just leave it. As in. Just leave it. I mean, you could you could also just strike it, but then you've got nothing. And well, we've got the whatever the, the federal regulations are, which you say are. are yes, but you don't have any. I'm not suggesting that you strike it. <laughs> I I think at least this it this is a a, a place that tells you something about. Uh, about um, what sort of a process it is, and uh, if we're lucky, you won't get any uh, proposals until after okay. the spring. Yeah. Uh, you could strike <coughs> it, but I think it's better to have something than nothing. Yeah. Move, move that the CPDC continue the public hearing for Article Eight of the the comprehensive update for the zoning until. Thursday, uh, whatever the appropriate date is, uh, 23rd. October 23rd. Is that what we want to do at this point? At 7.30 p.m. Like How much project. is it a substantial update that we need to do, or are there just a couple? Uh, mm, yeah, a dozen. All right. All those in favor? You said what time? 7.30? Yeah. On the calendar. Second. All in favor? It's a bummer. So can we finish the Well. <laughs> <laughs> Almost there. Almost there. Yeah. Well, a short meeting. Yeah. You sure. <laughs> A motion to adjourn. You have time to post it, right? Or did you already post it? No, you do have to post it. Oh.
Do you we don't have to post it. You don't have, you don't have to. Oh, you, you don't have to give the notice of public hearing. You don't have to post the meeting. I'm not posting. I don't. Yeah, there were. Um, they were hiding in pages behind other things. I know. I was just like, wait a minute. Do we want to do? Yes, there were minutes, minutes in this packet. There were in your desk packet. They were in the. In the desk packet. With, um, the I don't see them. Back. Oh. Sorry, that was kind of different. Let's knock them out on Thursday if we yeah, have a okay. short meeting. I just didn't see them. That's all. So. Oh, there they are. Um, I can see them now. Yeah, they're in there. Okay. I can email them all too. That's always easier because then I can just give you electronic. So, so beyond the table of uses, what other comments did we hear tonight that we didn't address? Well, I think what you can do is you can go through the rest of the, you know, Tony had some comments, but like I said, I think a lot of these are going to get addressed in your draft. Yeah. Unfortunately, I sent you were the comments. Sure. And the last round of response comments is set at 5 o'clock today. Yeah, that's, that's not what we've been looking for. So, um, tomorrow, next, on Thursday, we'll be working off of a cleaner version. Yeah, okay. That, that, that wasn't, though. <coughs> I, know, I, think that I think there was a version 4. Yeah. That was version 4, but commons only. That didn't have textual but edits in it. But you had the old yeah. It, no, it was, if you scroll down, it was there. The accessory apartment dwelling. For some reason, yeah. It didn't come out, but it came out in mine when I downloaded it. But for some reason, yeah, hers. All right, so maybe she was working on it. But there's some things that have been noted. We can probably fix them, but Yep. It seems like you turn it three days from two. Does that mean you get a meal in between? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if she had any other updates. Oh, yeah. Um, this is just a graphic that uh, Angela Binda had oh, yes. about the setbacks. I don't know so, if she has any other planning so updates she wants to front share. Setback, Otherwise, we can drag. So I think at one point we did have, I think we had required yard. <laughs> no. Okay, she's good. Move to adjourn. Was, but we could do well. Favor? I think it's clear to have both because obviously the yard is